Here we are. We are live on YouTube. Okay, so <clears throat> I welcome each and every one of us today's, um, I will call it a mind-blowing discussion. It is a discussion that has been, you know, boggling my mind for a very long time now. Because um, way back when I was still a student in Nigeria, I, um, I attended three major seminaries. I attended Ikote Bene, St. Joseph's Major Seminary, Ikote Bene. I attended Seat of Wisdom Seminary, Owere, and then Bigad Memorial Seminary, um, Enugu. While I was at Ekorebene, I joined the Pro-Life uh, Association. And during my, you know, um, during my stay at Ekorebene, we were very active both within the seminary and outside the seminary. So I had the opportunity of visiting schools and universities. And while we visit these universities, we tend to, you know, hear their voices, give them talks about life. Uh, one thing that always stands out while I visited, especially Upper Polytechnic, um, Imo State University, uh, Nekede, uh, Futo, um, Alvani Koku, these, you know, during my philosophy days, one thing that would always stand out was the fact that most Catholic students, you know, would leave the Catholic Church while they are at in the university, but would want to attend Catholic Church when they go back home to their parents. And one thing also I noticed about them was the fact that some of them would not wear trousers when they are um, at, with their parents at home, but would wear them when they go back to school. And they tend to say that when they come back to school, they join other churches and they allow them such freedom to do whatever they like, which they have not actually had when, you know, they are back home. So, and then when I, I went to Bigard Memorial Seminary, I had the privilege of being uh, the um, joining the NFCS and also being the vice president provincial, that is um, vice president NFCS, um, Anambra, um, Enugu and the Bonny State. And you know what NFCS stands for, Nigerian Federation of Catholic Students. So during my stay with NFCS and during the many experiences I've got with NFCS, these um, experiences also stood out. The fact that a whole lot of Catholic students, you know, would quit the Catholic church to join other churches. I do not know entirely their reasons. If I knew, or if I should know, I wouldn't say now because I would like our discussants here to tell us what they think uh, are the reasons why these people are leaving the Catholic church. Today, it is known that about 158 million Catholics are in Africa. And in Nigeria, we also have about 20 million Catholics. You know, about, um, uh, so uh, I was reading an article, it says 80 million Christians in Nigeria and 20 million of whom are Catholics. So 20 million Catholics. And predominantly these Catholics are from the Southeastern part of Nigeria like the evil side of Nigeria. And, oh, but also it is widespread within the West and the Northern part of Nigeria, you know. But then you find out that most young Catholics, most young people, you know, do not retain their faith. They don't stand firm with the Catholicism. You know, at a time in their life, they would uh, deviate from the faith. They will go to other churches. I read one article from an American magazine and one person was like, it's all about freedom. It's all about, you know, they don't allow us to do what we like, want to do. And that's why I want to leave. There is so much restrictions within, the, within Catholicism and that's why I want to leave. So um, many questions to be asked. 
But here we are today. I have here with me on our Faith Chat platform, um, Chair Makakwazo, Juliet Ani, Father Emmanuel, Father John Promise, Sonia Ago, uh, Ike Ezogo. I have all of you here to join me in this discussion. Let our voices be heard by everyone and let's see how we can, you know, find a way out to this particular situation. First of all, I would like to call Sonia to lead us in the opening prayer before we uh, go on. Sonia, are you there? I forgot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot my mic was off. Okay. So you are spotlighted now. Okay, so please let's pray. Please. So yeah, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, Lord God, we commit today into your holy hands. We thank you for making it possible that we're here. We pray that your Holy Spirit guides us. We pray that your Holy Spirit enlightens us. We pray that everything we say today at the end of the day brings glory to your holy name, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we also pray that everybody that needs to hear this, the lives that needs to be touched, are touched. The ones that need to connect are connected. And at the end of the day, may we have the fullest cause to glorify your name in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray for the intercession of our blessed Mother Mary as we say, Hail Mary. Full of grace. The Lord is with Lord thee. Is with Bless her, that um, you are most amen. Amen. And, and blessed is the fruit of the Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, Mother of God pray, pray for us in us now and the hour of our death. Yes. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the Father, and in the Son, and, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Sonia, for inviting that opening prayer. And um, I will immediately um, ask the question and invite Chiamaka Kwazo to um, answer our first question. And our first question here is this. Chiamaka, um, introduce yourself and then tell us what you think are the reasons why young people are leaving the Catholic Church. Thank you so much, Father. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you so much, Father, mm. for this platform again. Um, usually these days, the way I try to def describe myself or introduce myself, I say I'm an individual on the journey to self-awareness. Um, every day, I'm asking God to show me a bit hey. of him and to understand him better. Um, Professionally, I'm just going to give an overview of what I've been up to. Uh, before now, I, I finished from Unizik, Nigeria, uh, Nambia Zikiwe University, Orca. I read political science and through providence and God's grace, I got a job within the financial service industry as an investment, working in uh, investment banking. I proceeded to the UK to complete my master's and then also worked alongside as well within the financial service industry, but specifically now within um, credit reference and credit for just supporting individuals and helping them to manage their finances. Um, again, God's grace and, and of course, luck, hard work and everything. I got the opportunity to do my PhD and finish that last year. And also currently I teach within the same university where I completed my PhD and co-founded a company or a startup that is interested or is vested in uh, providing sustainable change within the education sector in Nigeria. Um, aside all of this, I also podcast as well, um, where I talk about my own experience, my awareness, and my journey to faith and to God. Now, this topic is something that I have often also pondered about from time to time. And I've also had my own fake crisis, I would say, as well. I've been invited to join other churches. I've gone to other churches as well myself. Um, 
what I would say is, I w- rather how I would answer or address this question, I often look at it from the standpoint of um, your own personal understanding of yourself and of God. Because until we find ourselves, until we find God, right, it's difficult to actually make sense of every other thing going on around us. And before now, I used to see God as someone who was sometimes distant, right, or sometimes uh, an image that was scary, an individual who was scary that I couldn't actually relate with, I couldn't understand with. And this is because of the way I've been introduced to God. Um, think about going back to catechism, where we often hear about God, where we often been told about God. We, we are made to assume that he's this person who is standing at the doorpost waiting for you with a cane to flog you every time you err. And so that image has been on my mind until recently that I've also come to see God as someone who is all forgiven, who is my father and who I can run to when I'm in, in, I'm, I'm in, I'm in some sort of fix or I'm down and out, right? But again, to understand ourselves and to understand God, we often run to something. We often hold on to something. And in our own case, we hold on to our faith, our religion. And in this instance, to talk about Christianity, we hold on to Christianity, right? Now, Karl Marx defines religion as the opium of a people. He likens it to a drug. I, I'm, again, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, opium, I feel, is something that is given or administered to patients who are struggling with pain, right? And it's given to them to alleviate whatever stress that they are facing, just to give them some sort of respite and to give them sort of um, peace. And this is what religion does for us. I would I say this is what Christ also does for us. This is what our faith does for us as well. And when we think about it, the question I would even want to answer, or the, the, the question I want to answer first is, um, how can the church get us to know ourselves better and to invariably also know God as well? Because it's in knowing all of this that it will, we would make sense of as to why we're actually living our faith, why we're trying to find it in different places and why we eventually come back when we come back. And I look at um, I look at this analogy that was given by um, a particular Jesuit priest is called uh, Gerard Hughes. And he's written several books and the particular one that struck out for me was the book he wrote about um, trying to get to know yourself and, and God and discussions around meditations and all of that. So he provided an analogy for an individual to understand their journey to faith, their journey to Christ, using the stages of human development and also the stages of faith as well. Now, the first stage of faith he described as a stage of infancy. At this stage of infancy, we're thinking about, think about the time you were a child, right? Going back to the, 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 the stage where you've been provided for by your parents, you ask questions, sometimes you get clarity, sometimes you don't. Now in a typical African home, when you ask questions, it's because I say so, right? It's not because they give you um, answers. It's only recently that we're now trying to profile answers to some questions that have been asked, right? So again, when you liken that to the stage of infancy of your faith development, he describes that stage of your infancy as an institutional stage where the church is trying to give you teachings and instructions. When you go to catechism, you learn about your faith. When you profess your baptism, if you eventually have the opportunity to do so at an older age, when you receive first Holy Communion, when you eventually do confirmation. Now, at this stage, is different things are happening. You don't quite understand the materials that you've been given, right? And I think for us, if, if I look back at the time when I did those um, classes, I don't recall anything that was taught in those classes. I don't remember anything that was taught in those classes. I was just there for the purpose of, yes, it's time to receive Holy Communion, let's go to confirmation or let's go to catechism. And it's been the same material that has been passed down for for ages now. Most of the the deliverables or the materials that we consume, we don't understand it. It's written in some languages that we can make sense of. So it's important now that the church pays attention at this stage of infancy where trust is required, where community is required, where instructions and teachings are given to children. It's important for the church to figure out a way to deliver this this content in bite sizes. And you liken it to your own faith, right? If you're a new Christian or a new Catholic, that you don't understand the doctrines that have been given to you and you're trying to make sense of it, but you're really not getting answers because 
all you're saying is, oh, here's a catechism to refer back to, or here is a doctrine to read or a dogma to read. There isn't exactly information provided. So it feels like as if the church is, again, I might be wrong, but this is where the priest would provide clarity for what playing catch up in this instance. Now, the danger of infancy is that you either remain there, right? You're stagnant, you're, you're stagnated, and you don't move on from that stage or you drop off entirely without professing any sort of faith. I refer to some um, interesting uh, statistics that I saw while trying to prepare for this particular discussion. And yes, it's in America and in the UK, but there are alarming figures that we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't ignore or we shouldn't pay attention to. 13, uh, the, 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 the median age of individuals or people who, stop this, who disaffiliate themselves from the Catholic faith is age 13. This is when individuals say, actually, I am no longer Catholic. I don't believe in the Catholic Church and what they are preaching or teaching. Now, within these two countries, in America and in the UK, 37% of the population who are Catholics no longer profess their faith. They don't believe in the Catholic faith anymore, right? It's not something that we can ignore or not pay attention to. In the same vein as well, they say individuals or adults born between the ages or in the year 86 to 1996, don't acknowledge any sort of faith. So one thing happens is they either become what you call nuns. It's not the nun that you know, N-U-N, it's the N-O-N-E's. They don't believe any kind of faith. They don't worship God, they just exist, right? So they either become nuns or they go on to become atheists or become agnostics. So it's important that these people are taken care of at that point of infancy, because that's when people drop off, people don't have a relationship. And oftentimes a lot of things happens at that moment of infancy. You're trying to encourage trust. You're trying to get people to trust what you're doing. And if we look back at our own history as well, with everything happening within the Catholic Church, there's been a lot of scandals that have been swept over. These things don't, they don't help our trust currency when we think about it. So these are things that the church has to take responsibility for. They have to bring these, uh, these culprits to book and they have to address them to, to also allow people to ask questions and to move on from that stage of infancy to a stage where they are like, okay, I understand this, I understand the teaching that you're giving me and giving me enough confidence to then ask questions to get onto the point of adolescence or the point within the faith development that we call uh, the critical stage. Now we know how adolescents are, we're rebellious, we're adventurous, we're deviant. And for us as well, it's a stage where we question a lot, everything that's been given to us, we question our faith, we question our parents, we don't obey and all of that. It is also for us at, at that stage, we're trying to discern our faith, we're trying to discern what it is exactly, or make sense of the teaching and also cry, try to also create a balance between what is existing, the realities existing in the world today, and what the church is saying. So it's not enough to just say, go and pray about it. How can the church help people to heal emotionally? How can the church help people to heal psychologically? What can the church use? There are mediums, right, these days that people have used evangelized gospel. And thank God for people like Father James that have been reaching people across the world with social media. How, the, how can we use these instruments to evangelize or to talk to people about God? It is an important factor that we should look at and then think about instruments or individuals to also use. Young people are the faces of tomorrow. These are people that will eventually become nuns, priests, fathers, bishops tomorrow. And it's important that their faith is taken care of. And it's also important that they're able to be, they are giving that sort of balance or harmony to make sense of what is happening in the world and what the church is also preaching. And then the final stage is the mystical stage in faith development and the stage of maturity for you as a Christian. Now, don't ask me where I am because I don't know which stage. I think um, for us individuals or for me personally, I, I would probably be in different stages, but again, it's a sub stage in all of those stages. Right now, the mystical stage is when you're questioning about your purpose, your inner, you're aware of your inner consciousness. You're aware of, okay, there is God. I understand that balance between my faith and the realities of what is going on. But then how does all of this tie together? What is my purpose? Yes, the church has, um, has provided opportunities for people to discern for their, their faith, but is it widespread? Is there a wide reach of people who are giving this opportunity to discern their faith?
Is there widespread of people who are given the opportunity to also nurture their faith, to seek what their purpose is on earth? Again, these are questions that we need to answer. And these are things that we need to create um, platforms for, for people to have that opportunity or openness to freely come to God, freely discern what their faith is. And I'm gonna leave you with this last point. The second point is, uh, I refer back to, I think, the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus was talking to his disciples about a divided house. I think oftentimes what we, we, fail to, we fail to realize something, right? We are tasked to teach and evangelize the Gospel and not to criticize. So oftentimes I've sat in churches and it's, the, the entire sermon is about what other churches are doing incorrectly or what other churches are doing wrong. The focus is what are we doing to draw people to God? Can we show people how to be drawn to God instead of, oh, these people are missing this, that, and this point. Let's show them the beauty of the Catholic Church. Let's show them the beauty of the sacraments. Let's show them the beauty of the blessed sacrament as well. It's important that we all come together to do this. So instead of castigating, the important thing is let's be Christians first. Let's identify the beauty in our differences and let us demonstrate as well how to be Catholics, how to be Christians. And that way probably we might get more people come back to the Catholic faith. Thank you for listening. Wow, thank you so much Chiamaka for that uh, very uh, mind blowing contribution. Um, I will go immediately to uh, Sonia to let us know what her mind is. So Sonia, over to you. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Thank you Chiamaka as well. I felt like you had already <laughs> said everything, but let me just, I'll just borrow some things from what you said. Yeah, my name is Sonia Agu. I'm a social entrepreneur in Nigerian as well. Um, so being Catholic for me is everything. The question is, why is everyone not Catholic? Why is everyone not still Catholic? And like Chamaka said, I mean, I've had the experience, I've had the opportunity or the autonomy to be or go to any church or visit any church. However, and I'm not saying this because I'm Catholic, but the Catholic church was where I found Christ. I found God for myself. So you see, but other other churches, and which is fine. Everybody has um, the thing that the how like, but everybody has what the um, what they're searching for. Let me put it like that. So if if you want if you want someone to show you to God, then I, you might not necessarily like the Catholic Church. I think the Catholic Church teaches you to connect with God personally. So you have a personal relationship with God, with Mother Mary, with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and whatnot. Yeah. So again, from borrowing from what Chemaka said, so the issues that go on in the Catholic Church, let me, I'll use myself as an example. I remember a time when I was in a group and then I had an accident and I went through like certain things, you know. I was expecting people to care about me or ask, oh, are you okay? Or how could we support or help? You know, I didn't get any of that. That singular act, act alone could have made me leave the Catholic Church and say, God forbid, look how people like this. However, it's not about that. You see, it's about God, it's about, it's about God and what I can get for myself or how I can best reach him. You know, I've also had an, I've had an experience firsthand with Christ. And this was in Vegas of all places. You can imagine the first time I ever found Christ was in Vegas. You know, I, I, I went to Vegas and, sorry, I was in Vegas with my friends and right next to the wind, is a Catholic church. And I remember my friends laughing, they're like, what's wrong with this Sonia babe? I went to church, you know, I went for mass. I was even wearing a shirt because we were about to go to the beach and it was so hot. And I went to the church, I was even wearing a shirt. Nobody even looked at me. I wasn't the only one wearing a shirt. It wasn't even as if I was wearing anything, you know? So it was very, you know, they were even excited to see me there in church. I received Christ and before the end of that day, I could literally see him, you know? So that was one. I've also had an experience with Mother Mary, you know? So these are just reasons. When I meet people and they say, oh, I used to be Catholic. I'm like, are you, are you serious? You used to be Catholic. Is that something you say casually? You know, I've also heard young people say things like, oh, I'm not Catholic because they don't really know how to pray. I understand that fact as well. So people, so people prefer fire-branded prayer and churches where you can. And then I say things like, oh, join the charismatic and whatnot. But then again, like Chiamaka said as well, I think it's our duty or that's why I'm also very particular with and, and thankful for Father James. I really like what you're doing, you know, 
maybe we should start, you know, teaching people more and more or bringing it into people's consciousness. Which other fire can be more than the blessed sacrament? Which other fire can be more than, you know, having these two seconds or two minutes with God? And you can just speak to him literally anytime. You know, so those are the kind of things that the Catholic Church teaches you. It teaches you how to just to do a novena. It teaches you how to meditate. It teaches you how to make an ejaculative prayer, you know, things like that. And if only we can, you know, maybe put it more into people's consciousness. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's, if, if people can, if you can put it more into people's consciousness and people can see and relate more, maybe break it down to them, then, yeah. I remember also being in that group. It was just one one of my friends then, Mr. Nicholas or something. He was the only one who tried to reach out and, you know, Aside that, I could have just left the Catholic Church. I've also had my experiences with other churches as well. And I could have said, oh, you know what? I'm not going to serve God again because all the vessels he had used to, or I've tried to reach him with, were bad people and they tried to, you know, but that's not it. So, yeah, I think that's about it. With my other friends, it's not even just about the Catholic Church. It's them just saying, I don't want to serve God anymore. You see? And I'm like, ah, why would you just wake up and say you don't want to serve God anymore? And in trying to get to, so I had one friend one time who told me that she didn't like God and she wasn't going to serve God. And in my mind, I thought I was strong. You know, so I, I, in my, my, my thought was, let me be close to her to change her. It was the grace of God that she didn't change me. You know, so nowadays, once I just meet a person that says they don't like God, I just take left or right, whichever way you're coming, I take the next, and then I will pray for you. You see, I will pray for you. I'll take, put your name in the blessed sacrament, but that's it. That energy to be extra, because I don't, uh, yes, if I go and follow you and fall into a pit or something, yeah. So I, I think that's about it. I, I also pray in other churches, I, and and I feel like God is everywhere. Actually, I feel like God is everywhere. I feel like God is everywhere. You can find God everywhere and anywhere. It, it's a matter of, of of your heart. It's what's in your heart that matters. I've been, I've had people, I've seen bad people in different other churches. I've also seen good people in good churches. You get, but I'm Catholic by choice. I like the fact that I'm Catholic. Nobody chose this um, being Catholic for me. I don't think my dad would, would stop me if I decide to be a Muslim today or even decide not to go to church. I don't think anybody will stop me. But I like the experience that I have with being a Catholic. It's me finding God for myself without stress. Me having a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God without feeling like, uh, you know, I even, I even feel like that's what God desires from everybody. So, yeah, I, I don't know if my few points have been able to do much. Thank you very much. Oh, Father, we can't hear you. Okay, so thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Sonia, for that beautiful contribution. Um, I will immediately uh, invite Ike Ezogo. Uh, Ike, if you introduce yourself and then um, uh, tell us what you think are the reasons why people are leaving the Catholic Church, especially young people. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Ike Ezogo. I live with my family here in Aberdeen. Thank you, Father James. Um, let me join the voices I've already thanked you. You're doing marvelously well. And uh, I tell you that you have loads of fans. You know, even folks are not Catholics. That's the truth. And uh, putting this together, this topic is an excellent one. And um, we can actually say enough. Um, we can actually provide a solution today but we can actually make an input. So we'll try. Why do young people leave Catholic Church, the Nigerian experience? I think that's what the topic is all about. In 2012, I made a trip to Nigeria and on my way back to UK, I sat beside a gent in the flight. And uh, as it is with my tradition, my routine to um, to say my rosary before I start in, in any any trip, in any of the trip that I embark on, I pull my rosary and uh, I did the usual. Then after I finished saying my rosary, I uh, 
the brother next to me introduced himself, Codley, and uh, asked, so you were Catholic? And I said, yes, I'm a Catholic. He said, oh, nice. I said, really? Yeah, nice. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be a Catholic. I'm loving it. I feel like I'm on the right track. And he said to me, I was born a Catholic. I used to be a Catholic. Then it was my turn to be curious. And of course I was. And I asked him, why did you leave? Then he said to me that um, he actually left. Um, I think that was his, uh, during his first year, just a few weeks into his first year in the university. <clears throat> he followed up, uh, I think he, his family, he was actually born and bred in Lagos, if I can remember candidly. But then he chose to he chose to study outside Lagos, just to be away from the family because I think he, he practically lived his life in Lagos. So he wanted away, you know, a little, uh, you know, he wanted a life away from Lagos. So on getting there, he didn't want to. He didn't fancy the idea of living in the campus. So he got a place outside the campus. And then uh, his first Sunday there, he found the church, the nearest church, around to attend his first mass in Ibado. That was the University of Ibado. He was very, very surprised that uh, not even a single person noticed him. He was not noticed. He went back, but he didn't actually want to go to the, uh, the, the, the chaplains in the, in the campus. He didn't want the, that, that distraction. He wanted a solemn, you know, where he can actually interact with the, uh, with the community, know the community, you know, since he sees the, the students and every other person every day in school, he also wants to have that life with the, <clears throat> with the, with the communities around there. So what happened is this, um, he attended uh, masses there for up to two, three Sundays and nothing changed. On the fourth Sunday, he slept in. Um, he woke up and realized he was 45 minutes late to mass. And he said to himself, oh, I, you know, in fact, he felt really, really bad. I couldn't make it. But lo and behold, his flatmate, you know, the person was sharing the flat, was still getting ready for, for, for church. He attends a Pentecostal uh, uh, church. So in, the guy, you know, summoned him to go with him. After a, a bit of persuasion, he agreed and joined him to, to their own service. On getting there, um, he realized this cheerful set of people, the ushers, they showed everybody there. We're very happy to see him. They were keen to know how he was doing. After the mass, they met him, they asked, they, they asked for his name, took his number, his address. They went as far as, you know, going personal, you know, has he registered, how is he getting on with his registrations, blah, 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 blah and all that. He felt really warm, he felt really welcome. But that did not stop him from going to the Catholic church. He went back again the next Sunday and went back to his normal church. And the experience wasn't, wasn't different from, from the first, you know, he, he, he felt. So after a few uh, 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 masses on the same, uh, um, at the same parish, I mean to say, he decided I mean, it's time for him to actually leave and go to where he feels welcome. So he eventually left. To be honest, I was really, really uh, um, short of words. I didn't know what to say to him, really, because uh, his points were really valid. But I said to him, um, uh, he could have actually started a group or maybe something, or maybe a, a committee of uh, you know, people that, you know, that thing that, that is lacking in the church, he would have actually made an impact instead of leaving. That thing that he saw, where he could actually brought it back into the church and make it happen, but he did left. That is, uh, you know, one of us lost because of our um, because of our inability to change with times without changing the core traditions of the church. I'm not as Catholic Church is unique. It's beautiful. It's awesome. But we need we need to make changes. So I would say that um, this is one of the reasons why we're losing, this is one of the reasons why we're losing some of our members. Inability of Catholic Church to show practical affections to, to our members. 
to really show that they care, you know, uh, by way of reaching out. That's one way that we are losing uh, our lenders. Then shallow, shallow knowledge of Catholic faith, lack of in-depth understanding of the word, the liturgy and the sacraments. At such, when flashed with all these abracadabra, you know, by all these churches, you know, they tend to, you know, get swayed away because we lack this in-depth knowledge of what liturgy really stands for. You know, these liturgy, the word and sacraments are a weapon. These are the things that makes us unique, makes us even better than any other thing you can think about. And that is why I'm still a Catholic and will forever be one. But be that as it may, the Catholic magisterium leave a lot to be accomplished by grace instead of teaching and evangelism. There should be more devotion. Time no, must be devoted into teaching of this truth than leaving it out for grace to, to accomplish them. You know, in the Catholic Church, uh, sorry, in the Bible, I mean, there are so many places that Christ himself encouraged evangelism. There are so many verses that are more than 15, more than 20, but I can mention a few. Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Mark 16, verse 15. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. Romans 1, verse 16. 2 Timothy 14, verse 5. So many of them, so many of them, uncountable places where evangelism is actually encouraged. It is time to actually reach out. <clears throat> If, if, you, if you went to church in 1853 and went to church just yesterday, there isn't much that has changed. Things need to change. I'm not asking for the tradition, for the core things. Those core things that make us unique, we need them. But there are a few, a few cosmetic touches that we need to apply in order to hold on to you. To, to, to our churches, I mean, to, to our youth, not leaving the churches. There is need to put a bit of life in the word, the liturgy. This can be done, like I said, without doing away with the core traditions of the church. Promotion of self, of, of uh, promotion of self Bible study. This, I feel, will make our youths closer to God. And this also will equip them so that when these people come with all these, their Bible that suits their whatever, they can be able to, you know, they'll be well equipped to defend themselves. So this is, uh, this is, um, this is, just a moment. I'm actually losing touch. So I would say when we um, when we look at this as a Catholic church, when the the, the Catholic leadership look look into this and find a way, I don't know uh, if it has if if they're going to do something because already the formation houses are doing are very very good spiritually. I don't know if one or two things need to be added in their curriculum. Father, this is not, this is not my, uh, my uh, but the formation houses like Ecotet, Benes, we need a little, a little bit of life. We need a little bit of life there. One second. Um, then there's this saying when you ask so many folks, they tell you that the Catholic Church is very boring. I don't blame them. It can be very boring. Can be very boring if you don't have that personal if you don't have that personal uh, skills you know how to engage with the blessed sacrament how to do your things solemnly you know it can be very boring um we need to create more activities for youths in the church it's the same order of mass every time all the order of mass shouldn't be changed. <laughs> that can only be done by the synod, you know, as far as them. No, I'm not asking that to be changed, 
But then let's create avenues. Let's, let's create uh, activities for the youth to socialize. Youth of these days are looking for mentors that will really teach them, you know, the things that pertain to their real life. Relationships, marriages. Some of our youths are even scared of getting into marriages. Even money, financial independence. It can be taught in the church. You know, these are the things that we need to uh, uh, look into, you know, to hold firm our youth from going away from the church. Um, some rigid stance on, uh, on uh, divorce is actually one of the reasons. In fact, I have a, I have a friend. Um, I have a friend. She was into abusive uh, marriage. In fact, their, their, their siblings actually claimed her from the hospital where she was hospitalized. But as I'm talking to you, she's finding it very, I mean, I mean it's so difficult to know the marriage because she wants to move on. Why make life miserable for people that are so faithful to you? It's so obvious. It wasn't her fault. She was in an abusive marriage. She went, she did everything possible. She fasted, she prayed. She went to the church, she went to God, God she went, she did everything possible to keep together her marriage, but he felt, why can't church have a genuine listening ear and make things quicker and faster? Why are they so rigid? I'm not trying to be critical here, but I'm only trying to speak for some, you know, some of our youths that live in the church. Now, this lady, as a matter of fact, you know, go on with another person. The person, as a matter of fact, it's a Catholic. He's a Catholic, but they cannot get married. Do you know what they did? They went to Pentecostal church and got married. So these are the things that we need to look into. These are the things that we need to look into. There are so many, so many, so many points that are raising, but as far as I'm concerned, these are the, the core ones. Other ones uh, for me, that are things of the world. I mean, spirituality is a different ball game. It's not uh, entertainment industry. So sometimes I don't regard some of other points, but these are, the core points I think we should look into. We should actually look after ourselves, look for ourselves, not just after ourselves. We should actually show practical affection to, to, to our, I mean, to brethren. You know, some, some people do it here. For instance, Father Kid he does it. I know Father James does it at, at times, you know, you know, they have things for, for the poor, they give us stuff, you know. These are the things that need to be done widely in the Catholic Church. There should be a body. You know, I know that we have things like that. I know we do have things like that, but I don't think it's uh, it's widely practiced. I don't think it's. I don't know. I don't want to go go ahead to criticize the church that I love so much. But folks are really leaving the church for some reason. That can be. Um, let me not go beyond the five minutes that uh, has been given to me. I think I've gone beyond that already. Um, and I allow uh, Juliet to go on. Um. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ike. Really, uh, I can see your 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 zeal there. I can see how you're pouring out your heart, and that's why uh, this platform has been created so that we can pour out our hearts. So thank you so much. It's been very interesting so far, and right from our um, YouTube, a whole lot of people. Uh, uh, you know, uh, making their comments and uh, letting their voices be heard as well. However, someone actually made a comment here, which, you know, um, uh, um, uh, attracted my attention. Um, and the person is saying that, yeah, okay, let me, let me get that comment. Please can the speaker or the speakers give their messages without speaking condescendingly about other churches. So um, if we can also mind that because it's very also important. So now I would like to invite um, Juliet Annie to let us know what she thinks about- Hi uh, everyone. Who are leaving the church. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Juliet. I'm into procurement and supply chain management. I stay in Aberdeen, Scotland. Um, first of all, I would like to really thank Father James for this platform and especially for this topic. It's 
um, a lot of people that I spoke to about it, they're quite keen on it and quite interested. And um, as you said earlier, it's a sensitive one as well, you know, one that we all can relate with, even those that are still in the Catholic Church, those that have left, those that are looking to join, those that are not even Catholics. It's quite an interesting topic. Um, one thing I wanted to say as well is the things that we talk about here now, I know somebody might say, oh no, but that also happens. Oh no, we have that. You know, why are people living? Oh, we have this. Oh, people support. You know, it's about culture. It's about what you're known for. It's about what's widely spread. You know, you can have pockets of things happen. I can have a friend check up on me and the friend is a Catholic, but how widely spread is that? You know, are we known for that? And um, what I'm talking about today is partly my opinion, as well as the viewpoint of a few people that I spoke to regarding this. Um, one of the things that came to light is some people are looking for miracle, you know, and maybe they are praying. So you could be in a vulnerable state, you know, some things are not going well, maybe exams, maybe relationship, maybe you want to get married. And at that point, you're praying and nothing is happening. And then you hear someone telling you, oh, come, my pastor will do something for you. Oh, come, my reverend will do this for you. I don't know. I, I can't talk much about that. But it's you can see somebody that is in a situation and then they change church and then things start moving well. So what would you say to that person? You know, I actually have, I can quote the person said, but in Catholic church, you're being told, wait on the Lord. So I can't comment more on that. I'm not, I'm not um, privileged in that aspect, you know, to be able to comment on that. But people are looking for answers to prayers and you might be somewhere and you're not getting that. And then you, you make a change and your prayers are answered and then you stay on there. Um, another thing that I know can happen for the youth, I remember when I was studying in Nigeria, I studied in Federal University of Technology, Oweri. You know, and if I see any bright poster, there is a little chance that it's a Catholic event. It's usually another church or another fellowship doing something. So they, they come to you. They are in your face. The person that will meet you and talk to you about church is most likely not going to be a Catholic student. You know, so that form of persuasion, you know, everywhere, and then they come to you talk to you about God. And then if you're at that point, you, you're not quite sure, you probably follow the person. So why are we not evangelizing that as much? Again, there are people that do that in the Catholic church, but how widely spread is it? And then there's the issue of relationships that we have. So the youth, they, they like groups, they like friendship. It could be a boyfriend, girlfriend, and even when it gets very serious, it could be marriage. So what would you say to a lady or a man that is getting married and would need to change from Catholic church to start attending another church for the purpose of that, for the purpose of a relationship or something like that? So, and then there's the thing about the foundation that we have, you know, in a typical um, Catholic home, how is the Catholic faith taught to the children? Is it just prescribed? When you wake up, say this, read from your simple prayer book. This is the angelus, this is the this. You know, is, is it just prescribed just to as, as you're told? When we have questions, do we get answers? To, do we get answers that are satisfactory? Or is it just, oh, why are we not speaking in tongues? You know what, join charism. You've not told me why, you've just pushed me on, you know, why do we have statues in the church? I think you should join the Legion of Mary. So things like that. And the world is changing as well. You know, people are getting more curious. I know that there is a lot more to the Catholic faith than the lay faithfuls know. You know, the priests may know a lot. Do we get told? And maybe there are platforms for getting it, you could check the internet, you could check doctrines and all of that, but it will definitely be more effective if it's coming from the altar. So I'm listening to my priest, what can I get from my priest about my faith? How can I understand my faith listening to my Catholic priest? 
or going to the catechism and it's not just the same prescription of this is how you do it and you ask what's the reason why I'm doing this just do it by faith you know so these are the kind of things that that came up when I discussed uh, with people again like the style of worship well for me the style of worship I believe that every church is as it is you know so while we could change that or do something about it, I know as well that the Catholic Church as, uh, as a church would have its own uh, way of doing things. I mean, there is also good, it's also good to be different this, if this is the way we are, but there definitely is room for improvement, room for change, room to acknowledge that things are changing around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliet, for, um, for that uh, very uh, great contribution. Um, I would like to say to Ada Abarakwe here, I think as I was about to, um, to uh, take control of one of the comments here, I mistakenly actually, okay, hid your own. So I've unhidden it now, which uh, your comments now will be seen. So thank you so much, Juliet. I'm just addressing a, a YouTube issue. So thank you so much for, for that. Um, I'll welcome right now Father John Promise. I believe uh, he's here uh, to let us into what uh, a response that he can give or the church can give to all these very um, um, contributions and these problems. Hello, good evening. My name is Father John Promise Ume Ozuru, and I am a priest of Portsmouth Diocese here in the UK, and currently one of the assistant priests here in the island of Jersey, one of the English Channel Islands. Don't worry, uh, later on I can tell you all the com complexities about uh, Jersey being uh, away from the UK and still part of the UK. But before I begin, can I say thank you to Father James for convoking this wonderful uh, session. And for all the contributors, those who've spoken, you spoke from your heart. And honestly, from my heart, thank you so much for all the things you said this evening. Can I then kick up by saying a few things? My talk this evening will be uh, on two wings. One will be to say what I think about why the youths are going away from the church, just to lend my voice to your voices. And secondly, what the church can do. I begin by saying on the 10th of October, 2020, just last year, the church canonized a young boy called, not well, beatified a young boy called Carlo Acutis. Carlo Acutis was born just in 1990, 1991, and he died when he was very young. Carlo Acutis, blessed, made a comment. He said, everyone is born as an original but many people that end up dying as photocopies. Everyone is born as a, an original, but many people end up dying as photocopies. Now, why, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because um, as Ch um, Chiamaka said earlier on in her statement, that yes, the church has everything and it is true because in the year 2000, Cardinal Ratzinger who was the Cardinal then, later on became Pope Benedict, issued a document we call in the church, Dominus Jesus. In that document, Ratzinger then said, everything about the Church of Christ, the fullness of the Church of Christ subsists in the Catholic Church. That is easier said than done. We can say, oh, the church has everything, but has the church cascaded this everything to everyone in that church? This is where, where I would then kick off with going back to the Great Commission. The Great Commission of Christ in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Christ said, go and make disciples of all nations. One of the things the church has failed to do till today is to make disciples, to make. You see, the church is good at going. I mean, the church, the Catholic church is universal, it's one, it's Catholic, it's everything. We are good at going but we are not yet good at making disciples. And in that commission of Christ, I can tell you the only thing that is infinite, we call it in Greek, the infinite, the infinite, infinite verb in Greek is to make disciples. Christ knows we will go. 
Christ Lord will baptize people and tell them the, the kingdom of God is here. But one thing Christ wants us to do is to make disciples. And that is where the church has gone, gone very wrong. You know, many people have pointed out here that they go to church and they're not even known. Now, I can tell you this. If I were to be a bishop and to be in Nigeria, one of the things I will mandate every priest to study, one of the book is Father James Malone's book called Divine Renovation, From Maintenance to Mission. From Maintenance to Mission. I can tell you this. In this book, Father James Malone is a priest from Canada but he goes around the whole world touring and speak, speaking to bishops and priests, telling them to change the course of history now unless we want to lose the entire church. Why do I say we must read this book? Chiamaka mentioned about the research in America. Again, I make, I will make mention to that research in America. That research was done by an institute we call CARA. CARA, that is in capital letters, C-A-R-A. CARA stands for the Center for Apply, Applied Research in the Apostolate. This is the center in the US that does all the researches on statistics in the church. Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate. Cara this said that of all the 100% Americans who were baptized and confirmed in the Catholic Church, only 30% of them are practicing. Only 30% are practicing. And they also went for that to say 38% of that 100% that, that, are, that we are Catholics, 38 of them do not practice at all. We might hear this in America and say, oh, well, it's not Nigeria. But I tell you, Nigerians are leaving the Catholic Church in their numbers, more so our youth. Because as far as James Mallon said, and as many of you have pointed, we have not learned the ministry of hospitality. When the church hears of hospitality, we think of going to hotel, isn't it? Sleeping on a double bed with white bed sheet, and people are wonderful and ecstatic. There is AC all through the night in Abuja and Lagos. And we have forgotten in the church, we need the ministry of hospitality. When people get to the door of the church, there should be people there to welcome them. And this is where the I'm sorry to use the word Pentecostals, but they are our, brother, our brothers and sisters. They are our friends. This is not being condescending, but to praise them. This is a place where Pentecostals are best. When you come to the door, they have the ushers neatly dressed. They are looking ecstatic. They are gorgeous and cute. You want to hug them, even sometimes even kiss them because they are looking wonderful. But you come to our Catholic church, we see all, Sorry, I'm not saying old people are not wonderful or some youths are not, are, are not well-dressed, but you see people who are looking haggard as if nothing happens, nothing matters. They don't even give you a wink. They just continue as if nothing has happened. And this is where Father James Malone is saying, we need to do better. We need to do better from the ministry of hospitality to the ministry of speaking the word, and I'll come to that. You know, when I was sent to Jersey, as um, uh, initially, I was invited to their youth program. And the, that is the first time I was invited, and as well as a spectator. And I sat behind there and saw what they were doing. Actually, I was about to doze off as a priest in a youth program. And at the end, I said, if we are uh, to continue this, this thing I'm, I'm seeing here, you can forget these young boys and girls. They will not come back. Because even as myself as a priest, couldn't connect with it. Many of you have said it here, the ministry of the word of God. Many of our priests, I'm sorry to use the word, but I'm a priest myself, so I can say it. Many of our priests are boring you to death. You come to the homily. They spend, first of all, they spend 30 minutes. I remember when we were, when I was in Nigeria as a seminarian, and Cardinal, Cardinal Arinze came to visit us in Tansi Seminary on Nietzsche. And one of us asked him the question of, what about priests who preach for 30 minutes? Cardinal Arinze said one thing. He said, are there not people in the church who can go and switch off the microphone? That was what he said. Are there not people in the church who can go up to the priest and switch off the microphone? Many, I am not saying people should begin now to revolt in the church, but many of our priests need to actually begin to take preparing homilies seriously. 
Father James know well as I do, and many people who live in outside Nigeria, you cannot preach more than, I mean, let's say 15 minutes on a Sunday mass. You, if you do it once, twice, they will call the bishop and say, come and take him away. So many of our priests in Nigeria will find it so difficult to survive the church here in overseas. It's not because the church here is watered down, no, part of it for sure, but because psychologists will tell us the attention span of human beings is just seven minutes. After seven minutes, even my, myself speaking to you today, after seven minutes, begin to say, oh, well, please round up, Father, just, you know, no, just get a move on, get a move on. But this is where our priests need to be concise and succinct. Prepare your homily, make it crisp. Anything you can say in 15 minutes, you can say it in five minutes, actually. Yes, we can add flesh onto it, but it's important that our homilies are lively and are not boring and are straight to the point. Another thing that, that breaks my heart is, when you go to the Pentecostal churches, and I know Ike did mention this, they have seminars on marriage. They have seminars on money. They have seminars on so many things, or even on employment. I, I grew up in Aba, went to Anicha, went to Enugu, and then went to Ibadan before I came to London. Never once a time did I hear a catechetical week in the Catholic in my parish being called for money or for marriage. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. It's for the, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the heaven and earth. Who cares about those things? For some, for some people should care, but there are pressing problems that people want to, to be identified with. You know what? Human beings, all of us are composite of body, soul, and spirit. Unless those three aspects are tackled and fed, we might be, you know, doing a losing game. We might be playing a losing game because everybody who comes to the church come to not to be entertained, not, not for sure, but they want to be entertained also in their mind. Feed their body, feed their spirit, feed their soul. And this is why if you go to the Pentecostal, the, the Pentecostal churches, they have seminars for marriage. There is this woman I listen to, even on first, I listen to, to her as a Catholic priest. I don't know her, her, her name now, Pastor, Pastor Jumoke or something. Where she talks to women, oh, you women, you should be sexy and gorgeous. And I said, yes, speak up, darling, keep speaking. When was the last time our priest called a seminar for young girls to teach them how to behave or how to prepare themselves for marriage? When was the last time they were called to teach them how to manage money? No, what they'll be called for is be those who are Chelsea, those who are Asna, time to contribute money for church projects, time to contribute money for this, for that. I am not saying projects are not wonderful. They are wonderful. But when was the last time you went to a Catholic church on a Sunday and there wasn't collection number two, number three, number four, those who support JS Chelsea and mind you and Manchester and Germany? What the hell is going on? It is high time as ministers, and somebody did mention it here, I think it is Ike who said, we should go back to the seminary. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And this is why, and this is weird. Why? Weird. If I'm also a bishop and is in Nigeria, another book I must recommend for every priest and seminarian to read is Forming Intentional Disciples. Forming Intentional Disciples. This is written again by another American, Sherry Waddell. This time a woman, a lay woman. Sherry Waddell in this book laments on the when I say the scanty, the scanty knowledge of Catholics, many of us have seen Protestants who will quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and we will, we will be shocked. Oh my God! Why can't Catholics study the Bible intentionally? And this is where our pastors, our priests, our priests, priests are also pastors, need to invest time in catechesis. Sunday Mass is not enough. To, to catechize people. There should be days, weeks mapped out for catechesis. And when you make it fun, people will come. And this is why Father James Marlon and Sherry Waddell actually came up with what we call today in the Catholic sector, the Alpha Course. The Alpha Course is a course where whether you are Catholics practicing or not, you come together like 
Christ methodology, you come together. We have a table to eat. We eat first and then we talk. Can priests in Nigeria do it? Yes, and I know people will say, but the number is too much. But we have what we call in Nigeria, the basic Christian communities. We can begin from there from societies, by parish priest assistant going to societies one after the other and catechizing them on what the church stands for. But having said that, an another book, not, not, uh, before I shut up, another book I would ask our young people to, to read and, and priest is the recent encyclical or what we call apostolic exalt exaltation written by Pope Francis for the youth. It's called Christus Vivid. Christus Vivid was written by, by Pope Francis on 25th of March, 2019. Let me just read one thing. Just one thing the Pope says. This is Christus Vivid number 174. 174. This is what the Pope says. I have been following news and reports of the many young people throughout the world who have taken to the streets to express the desire for a more just and fraternal society young people taking to the streets. The young want to be protagonists of change. Please do not leave it to others to be, to be this change. You are the ones who hold the future. Through you, the future enters into the world. I ask you to be protagonist of this transformation. And you can read the rest, 174. This gives what, the, what they call the pathway for youth ministry. Like somebody said here, you know, about youth ministry. Youth ministry in Nigeria, does it exist? We need to go back to basis. Get a form a youth ministry where youth are not just taught about faith. Take them to theaters, take them mountain hiking, take them to cinemas, take them to jogging, take them to football. The priest should be doing these things visible. This is the way we catechize here in Europe people who live in, in, in the UK or elsewhere in the world will know that. You don't, you, don't, you don't only catechize in the church, you catechize by meeting people where they are. Finally, before I shut up, I will also say, if, some, if people are thinking the church in, the U, in Europe and America are not taking this topic seriously, they might be joking. Another book people need to read is again published just last year called Mass Exodus. This is Max Exodus, Catholic disaffiliation in Britain and America since Vatican II, written by a professor in Oxford, Stephen, Stephen Bullivant. A, people in the UK and America are taking this point seriously. We might be saying, oh, Nigeria, people believe. I have friends and I have brothers and sisters who don't go to church because they are dis, 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 disillusioned with what is happening in the church. But what then is the way forward? Two things. We need to go back to the basis. We need to find that we need to make disciples. As disciples, Christ called disciples to do two things, to be with him and then to be sent out. We need to form Catholics who be with the Lord. Somebody mentioned about having a personal relationship with the Lord. Yes, we need to go back to that. People need to know the Lord, not contribute for Project one, project two, Father's house one, Father's house two, Father's car one, Father's car three. They need to actually be with the Lord. When they know the Lord and you send them out, there will be fire that will convert other people. If the 20 million Catholics, as Father James said, if the 20 million Catholics in Nigeria are Catholics, qua Catholics, Nigeria by now will be set ablaze. But I tell you, we have a long way to go. But we can start today to do those things. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Father, Father John Promise Umozu, for that very mind-blowing response to um, <clears throat> for that very mind-blowing response to the various questions and troubles being raised here. You also, I must say, raised your own um, troubles as well. You are actually, you know. Uh, raised a whole lot while you were talking. And a whole lot of people via our YouTube channel here, um, we are responding to your sayings and a whole lot of persons, we are saying yes 
to almost everything you said here today. Uh, let me just um, read out a few of them so that they will know that we are, you know, listening to them and seeing them. Um, Nkiru Kaolisaka said, in my experience, those who left the Catholic faith start a journey of Catholic shopping, reiterating the fact that whatever started this exodus hasn't been addressed, that, you know, their issues, you know, have not been addressed. And someone said there are lots of uh, Bible study uh, uh, groups in most parishes in, the, in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, but how many people are actually going in there. Someone said about hospitality that, and also about care, that um, there are many people within the church, uh, within the Catholic church, that it is very difficult to actually cater for everyone. And someone else says that their priest, I think this one is by UC Ventures, he says that the, the, he knows a priest or she knows a priest that preaches for about four to five minutes four to five minutes, but the preaching is so realistic that the preaching is so sweet that people would even want him to continue. So this is a different aspect of that as well. Um, and then another one says, I don't think anyone is stopping the youth from joining groups like Hospitality uh, Church Warden. Um, and then Zimi Abarakwe Jr. says, faith isn't just a notion that some people hold on to in tough times, that faith is an important element to all human life on earth. That is why we must hold on to our faith. Someone else, uh, Claire Michael says that the Catholic church should allow their members to, you know, to feel more vulnerable and, uh, you know, to, there should be that, you know, openness for the members to feel more vulnerable, even though I don't really understand uh, what she meant there. However, I would like to invite now Father Emmanuel to let us into uh, what he thinks uh, about all these uh, issues raised here today. Father Emmanuel, over to you. Okay. Um, hello, thank you everyone. It's uh, quite exciting being here. It's quite encouraging being here. I'm actually Father Emmanuel Unekwajo I'm from the Catholic Diocese of Ida in Kogi State. I'm a Catholic priest uh, who lives in Nigeria. And somehow I've never been outside Africa. And it feels strange that I've never been outside Africa, but somehow by grace and by, by opportunity, I have a lot of experience connecting with people like Father James. He was searching for me. I was searching for him. We didn't know we we're following each other already until he said that. And it's quite encouraging that we're here and having these, these, um, um, these topics. He found me out in a, at a very critical moment. Well, I'm not going to disclose my location, but it's encouraging that I'm able to get out and be here at this point. Well, um, I know for a fact I'm somebody who's been enthusiastic about topics like this that you come across as being um, divergent, you come across as being a non-conformist. Uh, while Father John Promise was talking, I could see a little bit of my thought system and thought pattern, but unfortunately, you're outside the war zone. So some of us here can get cut down. But the truth is, without any fear or prejudice, we have learned to enjoy being Catholics who have learned to enjoy being priests in Nigeria. This is my ATM being a priest and I wouldn't give anything for it. Being a Catholic is a gift, like many persons have said. And being a priest is one of the best gifts anyone can ever get in their lives. I'm not saying everyone, sometimes I will shamelessly confess that I try to dis discourage a few young fellows from being, I even said it to, one of the young persons around me. While I was getting dressed up, I saw him smiling because I couldn't find my collar. So he had to go out quickly and go get one for me from the Pauline bookshop. And he was smiling. And I'm thinking, see, if it's because of this one, I'm going to get into the priesthood. I beg, don't spoil this work for us. And we just laughed about it. But over time, I've come to realize certain things. Three major incidences. Uh, incidents, I mean, um, got my attention between last day and this time. 
on the 20th of, um, the, okay, first was the, the pandemic. It was really, really disheartening. It really showed us why we were praised. Like without these people, we are nobodies. Like the other priests um, I was living with, we're just trekking aimlessly around. There was a day we did 19 kilometer trek, a 19 kilometer trek out of joblessness. We missed everyone we looked down in church. All those old women who come to hug you and embrace you and show you raw faith. We missed all of them. Then the young people who you tend to look them at, look at them as, um, as non-entities, people who are failures, you know, because you're privileged as a priest, as a prince of the church, you know, for you who's, who, who's in the palace, you think everyone outside the palace is a pauper. We are privileged. You went to school, read books, you know, see Father John promised, dishing out books and saying all of, all of those things. But it's a privilege by grace. I'm an advocate of grace. But like, you know, I felt attacked when somebody said on a light note that we have left, I think it was Ike who said it, that we have left too much for grace, you know, to take care of. And I, I felt attacked. I was like, maybe I'm peddling grace too much. But going back to the three major you know, things that called my attention, first, before that time, was the pandemic. I think I was one of the first persons to join the Facebook, even though I didn't know what it was then. I think it was February 3rd, 1999, I came on Facebook. And I know priests who fought me and insulted me. And even regular people, you are going there, you are going to the world and all of that. Three years down the line, they sent me friend request, and I just clicked delete or ignore because I'm saying you guys don't get what we're about. Because I, well, without knowing, I didn't know the church was going to move beyond the physical. You know, I didn't know we we're going to have virtual chaplaincy. I call my own chaplaincy virtual chaplaincy as I figured it in my head, St. Christopher's virtual chaplaincy, where I do every Sunday until I became a little indisposed in recent times. I'm talking about Lent or homilies and stuff. I get to just forget myself if I go beyond my regular 10 minutes. I begin to just babble. I, I could make sense, but maybe that's not what I prepared to say those days. And I started doing the one minute homily in 59 seconds. I say what I need to say for the Sunday. I left it, I, did, I designed it for Instagram, but over time I put it a bit on Facebook and on YouTube. So it was what I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I was just having fun. But until a few persons drew my attention, oh, Father, this is what we want. But the idea was I saw people who could do things and plant crazy ideas in your head, you know, in 59 seconds on Instagram. And I thought if that was the case, if they could plant these dirty and crazy ideas in your head in 59 seconds, I can also plant the gospel and the word of God in your head and in your heart in 59 seconds, and somehow it's working. Until recent times, I'm not able to do. Then we now moved on to designing the little posters that comes out twice a week to put little ideas in your head. You know, when there's a slang going on, for example, I will just pick that slang or that meme and try to Christianize it. For example, I think the last, last year's Pentecost, it was, what was trending was the whole, um, now the matter we still settle. And I went on to say, that matter where you see the settle, the Holy Spirit has settled it. And it went you know, out for a bit. I tried to pick up those regular things. I remember the story of um, Will Smith and um, Jerry Pinkett, you know, when they did the whole entanglement thing and August. And coincidentally, it was becoming, we got into August. So my new month message was this August, referring to the normal, the August that was trending. This August, may the Holy Spirit give you the grace you know, of entanglement. And little persons went into my DMs and said like, ah, but I, I just thought if you, if you settle down, we have ways of reaching out to these people. I'm trying not to lament because I found very gory details and gory statistics. You know, for example, Bishop Barron, you know, the, the, the American Bishop, I think I shared that uh, material with Father James. You know, said for, for every Catholic convert, 6.5 Catholics are going out 
for one Catholic convert that coming. It's, it's quite scary. And the painful part is the part that I just thought to myself that what if we are, we are the ones chasing these people? I just had a lot of what ifs. But going back to the things that brought my attention to these things over time, I'll just be the regular priest who does everything. You know, the pandemic. I saw that many persons were longing for more than we, we thought we had to offer. You know, people wanted masses online. People wanted you. My DMs are full with Americans, Australians, people you would never meet in life who ask you for prayers, who ask you, people ask you all kinds of questions from homosexuality to divorce to all kinds of things that we never knew would become issues in our, in our lifetime. The pandemic brought all of that out. Then on 20th of October, I think, I sat in front of the church and I was crying like a baby. You know, when I saw, I watched the lucky um, incident, life. I was crying, my nose was dripping. When I saw blood, I saw I on DJ switch. I was there, I was watching and I was crying. And I just imagined this is possibly what will be happening to the young people in the church. Maybe they're not coming out with placards, but maybe the things we say to them, maybe the ideas and notions we have of them are like the bullets from the guns of these soldiers, cutting them down and we are all living in denial. See the stories of these young people in a PhD holder, people who don't live with him, see all their pains. I have a hundred things to say, being, um, forget my environment. I just, I'm just privileged to be here today. I'm a proper village priest. I enjoy it. I have fun with it. You know, but I think of those who don't have the privilege of the kind of raw faith that you find in the villages. Who are, you know, I'm happy that Father James is countering the, the, the challenges and all of that. You know, he, he picked some of those things. You know, I was the one who first called him the TikTok priest. And I didn't know that he was going to stick with him. So everyone, I want to say the TikTok priest. Everybody knows you're talking about that. I just made it with just a funny comment. And that's talk, and it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. And with that happened, that's the second incident. The third incident recently is, um, which one I think I've lost my line of thought, but I just know that somewhere along the line, we are losing a lot of people. And in many cases, in many cases, is because we have not paid a lot of attention. Now, not because it's our fault, you know, but because you can, you can tell a lie by omission or by commission by what you say or what you do not say. So sometimes we are guilty by the things we have not paid attention to. For example, there's too much sense of freedom. That too much sense of freedom. During the, after the lockdown and all of that, a lot of young people were home. And I formed a group of young people, just my own ways. I, I try to be active on social media. Sometimes I put out useless content just to get their attention. They ask you questions. Then from there you go. You know, I did what I call the village square meeting. And the village square meeting, myself and the young people, we talk, I say that's where we talk about everything and anything, from sex to music to marriage. We talked about everything. And you'd be amazed at the things that these young people have to talk about. I, I thought that I just wanted to while away time. I, I would just have too much on my hand. But they already had, even when I was not there, they, held, they were holding these meetings. And some days I had the thought because it was a neutral ground where you could say what you need to say. Now, what I'm saying this is, I think that even young people shouldn't even, they should call us out like this. Please, they should call us out. And as I'm saying, they should call us out like what is happening. The idea is a game plan. Let's not just not talk here. I have reasons why people leave the church, a lot of useless, but one of the major ones is this false sense of freedom. This false sense of freedom. I think as a person, as a priest, let's do more listening. Let's go out shamelessly and preach this gospel. Father James is shameless enough 
by smiling sheepishly every day online. I like that fact. But let's do more. And I think also this is me pleading with the young people to also try to make efforts and not leave just the church to do it. There are societies in the church, make effort also. Many of us priests come from villages. It's the seminaries and these things that make us to have this exposure. So for those of you who have the exposure, call our attention to it. So I, I think, you know, to, to wrap up what I need to say here, you know, is that let everyone, I think we just need a game plan and it's moving from the Pope to the bishops, to the priests and the youth themselves who are living. Don't just up and go. Make your voice heard. If they are not listening, you know, try harder because of the places you are going to, you may find the same things, but you cannot come back again just because, you know, you left already. Families have been destroyed, you know, which is the core part of the Catholic Church. Speak to people, to people find help, go online, talk to a priest, something before you up and go so that, you know, this um, crumbled walls we are dealing with. We now know which side to begin to lift it from. So thank you very much. I'm happy. Let's do more of this. I'm grateful to all of you for coming out and voicing like this. Let's do more. Let's come out like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Father Emmanuel. Um, <clears throat> I met Father Emmanuel. Um, okay. So I met Father Emmanuel via um, Instagram, but I was introduced to Father Emmanuel by a very good friend, Father Pascal Baleke. When the last time I was looking for a priest to join in one of our conversations, and uh, he advised me to involve him, and I started looking for him, and suddenly I noticed actually he has been following me via Instagram, and uh, immediately I started following him back, and we started the communication. So thank you so much, Father Emmanuel, for raising that um, those ideas. Now we are going into what can the church now do as individual parishes, as priests, as individuals as well within the church. What can the church do? And we have people raising up their hands here to say something. But I would like to also recognize our viewers via YouTube and read out some of their comments. Um, okay. Um, someone actually praising the Catholic Church and says, the beauty of Catholic community is we are universal. So that is wonderful. Um, and then someone said, imagine in, in terms of hospitality, imagine coming out to, because I witnessed it while I was in Aba in Nigeria. Um, it's kind of difficult to really stand by the door as we do here after masses every day to, well, to say to people, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming, you know, to shake people's hands, to say to them, thank you. And secondly, also you find out that immediately after one mass, the second mass is going in. So it's advice, these people are living through this door, the others are living, are entering through the other door. And it could be the same priest who celebrated the last mass will be celebrating the next mass. So there needs to be some kind of coordination. And I love what, the Father, uh, what Father John Promise said. Father John Promise, he made mention of, um, we need to focus more on during the weekdays. You know, the priest needs to be very, very active during the weekdays also in catechizing the people because the people need some kind of knowledge. And that knowledge is not the type of knowledge that, you know, are very highly theological. There should be some kind of, you know, realistic understanding of Catholic doctrines, realistic understanding of Catholic doctrines. And E.K. Ezog, you made mention of going back to the seminary. I think that has to do with going back to the root, that, that there should be a kind of, uh, you know, um, addition may be to the formation of priests, seminarians and the rest, so that they can also carry it along. You know, when you talk of uh, divine uh, renovation, you know, when they need to come in and carry it 
on into the people, you know, being there, sympathetic with the people, empathy, show empathy, you know, to the people, show, you know, that we are for them and they, we cannot do without the people. As far as the people also need us in their life, we, they need, uh, we need them also in our own life and be there because we have been called to make sacrifices. All these things are boiling down to priestly activities as well. I would like to invite um, Father Valentine Mora. I think uh, Father Valentine is joining us from Germany. Um, he's got a contribution also to make to this regard. Father Valentine, you introduce yourself and uh, you have the floor. Hello, Father James. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a little correction. I'm not joining from Germany. I'm actually joining from the United States. So uh, um, that's why most of the time I was just smiling and laughing and shaking my head, especially when Father John Promise spoke, because most of the things that he talked about with the U.S. church um, are the things that I am conversant with and that, you know, I've, we've talked about it. We've heard these things happening. Um, and, and yes, so I, I am a priest of the Diocese of Springfield in the western part of Massachusetts, just two hours away from the famous city, the um, sex scandal city, uh, if you remember the spotlight. Um, so I am, just two, I am just two hours away from Boston. You know, Father, Father um, Valentine, can I come in there? Apologies because uh, congratulations on your ordination. Yes, yes. You are, you are I've met you before in Nigeria via I Father yes. and several <laughs> we've known. And this is just me realizing it. Apologies. Thank you no, so much. No, it's fine. We've uh, we've grown old and we've added more weight and you know the hair and all that and we lost some as well. But uh, but uh, I thank Desmond also for mentioning this to me and um no, really, I, I just want to appreciate everybody for all the points that we've raised so far, and I think they are all pertinent and they are very, very important. Um, but, but I would just like to take a few moments to just talk about the way forward, you know, because when I think about it myself, you know, as a teenager who grew up in Nigeria, even before coming over to the United States to study and then go to the seminary and become a priest and all that, I think back to my experience when I was back home and, and I... You know, I, I remember that I was one of those teenagers who would sometimes shy away from going to mass because there is a project Sunday, you know. Um, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, I, I lived in Fege and my parish then was Immaculate Heart. Um, but whenever there is project Sunday, I would skip mass. Sometimes I'll just stay home and not go or when I'm in my good spirits, I will keep going to mass at Immaculate Heart and I will trek about 30 more minutes to go to St. Michael's Fege, or maybe about 45 minutes, just 15 Naira Okada, and I'm up there at St. Jude's Fege, you know, um, to go to mass there and come back home just because I feel like it's so boring. It takes a lot of time, you know, that after communion, we sit down there and we just talk about money and push people to come out. And just like Father said, you know, we adopt new methods of like putting our hands right inside people's pockets. You know, what, what, what club are you supporting? You know, and then you begin to see people coming to church with jerseys on those days and, and, you know, printing flags and things like that. And honestly, for me at that time, um, it, it, it wasn't really funny, you know, and, and I wasn't really enjoying it because it wasn't contributing anything to my relationship with Christ and also to my growth as a young Catholic. Um, if anything at all, it was just telling me to go out there, make some money, come back and show myself in the church. Um, you know, but, but, but again, I thank God that, you know, I, I, I come from one of those families where you wake up at 4, 4 30 a.m. in the morning to say the rosary. And if you're sleeping, you know, you get your punishment and things like that, <laughs> you know. Um, and so when, when these things started happening in my life, I, I think it was my family background um, that kept me going in the church. But outside of that, you see, I was a candidate to live in the church at that time with all those things going on. Um, come over here in the United States too, I've heard, and even like in the Nigerian communities here in the United, in the United States, I've heard people say things like, you know, their kids don't go to mass with them, you know, because you have like Nigerian or Igbo Catholic communities there here. And parents would often complain about their kids not going with them. You know, and sometimes they'll say, oh, that priest, we already know what he's gonna preach. 
you know, his homily, we already know. And there is one I was told about that said his homily every Sunday, it's always, he always begins with, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this in Igbo, but he always begins with, like, you remember that thing that I told you last time? <laughs> that is always his line for every homily. You remember the, the thing I told you the last time? And that is always the thing all the time. And, and you know, one thing that, you know, when we complain now and we say, you know, we are losing all these people to Pentecostalism or, you know, to these new pastors and stuff. Um, I say to myself, I understand this because these guys who are coming up recently, they understand that you need to know the signs of times and, and incorporate those signs of times into your ministry, into whatever you are doing. Let's think about the very recent one that is happening in Onicha, the Onyeze Jesus pastor that came out. What is the guy doing? He is incorporating the signs of time into whatever fake ministration he is doing because he understood where the people were, what they wanted. And he came out and he's giving it all to them. Let's talk about in Daboski, you know, the fire by fire past. I mean, these are people that they understood where these people are and they are using those signs of time to provide to that and then draw them closer to them. You know, let's talk about um, uh, Pastor um, Paula Deferasen, you know, the convener of the experience. You know, I watched the experience the other time and, and you could think about that. For me to watch the experience, I will have to stay awake here till maybe 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in order to watch that live. And, and I was glued to my TV. Why? Because he understood that the time we are in right now is a time that demands eloquence, you know, that when you speak to the people, you give them something. It's not about, um, um, you remember what I told you last time? No, people want to hear you. They want to get something out of your teachings, your preachings, what you're telling them, you know. And so in my head, I am thinking that where we are right now is a place where all of us, ministers of God, priests, you know, lay, lay faithful, all of us should be thinking of how we can incorporate the signs of times into the present life of the church. And when you talk about that, it affects everything. You talk about the hospitality, you know, I can think back and remember in my parish those days, one church worthy man that when he is the one there, my sister will always refuse to go to church. When, when that man is the man in front of the door, my sister will refuse to come in because she will say, I know he will, he will turn me out. Um, you know, and that is because people think that this has become their own thing. You know, we are talking about this. Some of us are from the eastern part of Nigeria, right? We are talking about the same Catholic church. But I think maybe in Lagos, you have churches in Lagos where people could go to church wearing trousers, leaving their hairs bare, just the same way it is in Europe and even here in the U.S. Um, but you can't do that in the East. So what do you have? You're going to have a girl who they go to the East, they will go to church, like Father James said, just because they want to please their parents. But when they go back to their city, they won't go to Catholic church anymore. And at some point when they feel like they are now independent and they, they can actually stand their parents, they will make the decision not to go to church anymore because people don't want to live a double life, kind of. Um, you know, so just to conclude what, what, what my suggestion is and the way forward that we need to read the signs of times and we need to incorporate these signs into our ministration and into our pastoral activities. I just want to take up a quote from um, the Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes. It says, inspired by no earthly ambition, the church seeks but a solitary goal. And I put in brackets there, salvation. Salvation is the solitary goal of the church. To carry forward the work of Christ under the lead of befriending spirit. And I put in brackets there, charity. And so if you bring these two together, salvation and charity, that means we can never as a church turn anybody away right? If our goal is for salvation, then we are focused on that. And we have to do everything we can do to bring people to salvation. Um, St. Vincent Paluti, the founder of the Palutine Fathers, he said, when he was asked, what is the apostolate of the congregation that you are founding? He said, I am founding a Catholic a society for the Catholic apostolate because they have to do everything Catholic to bring people to salvation. 
And so if we agree that yes, it is salvation, then we have to do that in the most charitable way that we can. And that is by understanding where our people are and bringing the message to them in a way that they will accept it, in a way that they will walk with us. Wow, thank you so much, Father Valentine, for that uh, very beautiful contribution. And um, it has to do with, um, it has to do with um, our openness to the signs of time, our openness to this ministry, you know, always being refreshed by what the time is all about and trying, and that is enculturation, that is enculturation, trying to bring in what the culture is all about into our ministry. Because someone said, um, I, I, I cannot, you cannot tell me to raise my children as my parents raised me because I am not um, um, the time. This is not, you know, it's a different time now. So the way they raised me then is no longer the way children are being raised now. We are in a different um, um, a time. So something new needs to be done. Now let's go back to the YouTube and read some comments. Um, Ikenna, uh, before Ikenna, the B Bo says, uh, somebody who is thinking of leaving the church will not likely be spending time on weekday masses. So, so who will the priests be evangelizing you know, on weekdays? That's also very important. Uh, Father, Father John promised you would wanted to say something. So after uh, Desmond, I will invite you. And then Ikenna Baleke says, uh, while the leadership of the priest is very essential in the church, it is also important for lay people to realize their own leadership roles in the church by virtue of their baptism. So lay people also have a huge contribution to make here. He says, we can also grow as a church community with pastora and missional initiatives coming from the pews, you know, coming from the people. But that's, that has to do with the priests being open to listen to the people, being open to know what the people has to say, and also in his humility, being able to, you know, put them into, ask himself, what is the church saying about this, and how can we carry it out? And it's also very important. Um, very awesome, I would say, uh, for to make the church more relevant for the 2021 Catholic youths, so the church should be more relevant for the 2021 Catholic youths. Let our core values as Catholics remain intact. Of course, very important. Um, okay, so now let me invite um, Desmond uh, from uh, Germany. We are all Nigerians. So when I say this person is from here or here, never mind, we are all Nigerians. And whatever that is happening in Nigeria concerns us as well because that is our homeland. So uh, Desmond, um, over to you. Introduce yourself and yeah, over to you. Okay, thank you, Father. Um, like you said, uh, my name is Desmond uh, Okwo. I live here in Germany with my family and uh, I grew up in Onicha before I moved to Germany for further studies and now working with the university. Sorry, uh, sorry, before you continue, I know you wouldn't mention this, but Desmond was um, uh, in charge of the youth in Anambra State, like I think Catholic youths in Anambra State, yeah, in the whole of, you know, kind of Anambra State. He, so he was in charge of the Catholic youths in Anambra State before he, he ran away to Germany, sorry, before he left for, for Germany. But um, please, um, he has got wealth of experience in this regard. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Father. Um, First of all, thank you. This is a very wonderful idea that you've raised the, the platform. In fact, I was jumping when I, I saw the, the poster. I, I, was, I felt like, how did you um, go into my, my mind to um, know what I was really thinking we needed now, uh, especially um, with the recent event uh, in Nigeria among the youths. Um, like you said, yes, I worked in the youth apostolate. So I really kind of felt it personally because I know this thing, I'm wearing the shoe and I know how, how it pinches. And I, I look at the youths that uh, I, I did the apostolate, the youth apostolate with them, or the people that are still there now. And I feel like there is an information they need to be given um, supply to, or there is something the church needs to give to them to make sure that their time as youth 
is not wasted and they are maximized uh, for the good of the church and their own good as well. So I, I think all the people that have said something really covered most of the things I wanted to say. So basically just to say thank you guys for uh, the wonderful ideas you've raised. I, I'm just going to maybe emphasize on two points and that will be it. Um, first is the population of Catholics in Nigeria, especially in the Eastern part, like uh, Father Valentine said. Um, I think that has removed from um, the church authority uh, uh, we have the spirit of um, working harder as, because they feel our, people are there, we are taking them for granted almost, and tomorrow they're going to be there. If they don't come to church, they will have to go to confession or kind of, uh, it's like, of course they are going to come. So I don't have to go extra mile to make them uh, feel that their coming is really worth it. So I feel sometimes we, we, we don't take care of our youth when they are more than 12 years. Before 12 years, the Catholic Church have what I think is the best youth formation program for, for the young ones, because they go to Brock Rosary, they are taken care of, they go to mass, all these things. But once they are 12, after their first communion and um, confirmation, uh, they start going into secondary school and they, they, they kind of realize there is no role for me here in the church. I don't have any role. The only role I have is to come and clean the church. Aside that, I don't have any role. And of course, we know that nature upholds a vacuum and they try to Sorry, we can't hear you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, we can't hear you still, no? Um, no, we can't hear you still. Can you check your um, speaker? Uh, no? Okay, okay, so, yeah, okay, so I'll go over to, yeah, just uh, work on that, because what you are saying, uh, very important, we are uh, making a great point there, uh, but um, your, your, your speaker, you know, or your microphone couldn't let you in, but I'm sure what we are saying there uh, was great, and um, someone made mention of family, what is the role of family in our discussion today, because as well, the family needs to play a great part in the life of every young person. The family needs to play a great part. But for me, the family cannot play a great part because you cannot give what you don't have. If the family do not understand the teachings, they will not be able to transmit the teachings to their children. I face such here as well. It is something general. You know, you need to catechize the family. We really need to catechize the family so that the family can transmit this faith to their children so that their children can grow and then transmit the faith to, to the rest. And then someone made mention of that we should take away bulletin and allow people to come to church with their Bible we should let the church come, people come to church with their Bible, even when the bulletins are there, because announcements are actually within the bulletins, but let the people know their Bible, let the people come and be active within the church with their Bible. And, um, okay, you made mention of block rosary. <laughs> That's another one. That's another one. Because I grew up attending block rosary. Like my... You know, we used to call brother, uh, my brother then uh, at the block rosary, later on became my classmate, like my brother, you know, you see, you see that, my brother, later on became my classmate at the seminary, I hope he doesn't listen to this, but later on he became my classmate in the seminary, you understand, and when I saw him uh, at City of Houston, I was like, bro Joe, you know, that kind of thing, but you know, I, I grew up within the block rosary, it was great, but listen, there was so much disparity 
the young persons in the blood cruiser, the children, are not allowed really to express themselves even more. They can't join within the decision makers. So the older people would also make the decisions for them and it carries along. So how do we involve these young people to become part of decision making within our small, small parishes? Thank you so much Desmond for mentioning these things. And I believe if you, um, if you address uh, your microphone, then uh, you'll come back. Can you say something uh, and see if it's working? Uh, no, it's not yet working. So <laughs> could you address it? And yeah, we'll invite you back. So I'll invite Father John Promise now to let us into his mind. Uh, well, just a few things I would like to um, add on the things already said. I mean, everything said here, it has been very wonderful and I cannot take anything away from it. I just want to point at something. You see, last year we had the NSARS uh, protest, isn't it, in, in Nigeria. It was started not by the oldies in Nigeria, but by the youths. This is a clear fact that if, the, if Niger the church in Nigeria has got to move on, the youths have got to be involved. Be there, as Father James said, priests, religious people, or lay people. And having been here in the UK, I encourage the church of the lay people. Again, going back to what John Paul II wrote in Fidelis Leite, Fidelis Christi Leite, or Christi Fidelis Leite document, John Paul wrote about Christ lay faithful. It's important to encourage them, to bring them into the decision making of the church. But one thing I want to say again is about the issue of knowledge. I find some priests in Nigeria, it's not that they don't know, because they, they do know, I mean, they are very intelligent, but it seems to me, many of our priests and you know, clerics hide the knowledge they have. Why do I say that? Somebody here did mention about the issue of marriage and divorce and annulment. I mean, I studied that in Nigeria, but I studied that more here in the seminary before I became a priest here. You see, one of the areas many Catholics don't know in Nigeria is the, issue, the area of marriage, divorce, and annulment. Or we don't have, well, we don't have divorce in the Catholic church, but we have annulment. From my diocese here of Portsmouth, the rule by the bishops of England and Wales, and I know for James, you know, will concur to that, is once an annulment process begins, it takes only 18 months for it to be concluded. Why do I say this? I live, my parish priest here is a canonist, and that is his area of marriage. And having been here, I've learned a lot from him about marriage. But in fact, I'm, I'm actually dealing with my first case of annulment at this time. Once annulment process begins, 18 months, not 10 years, not donkey years, it goes on and on and on in Nigeria. Why am I saying that? it is important that our priests begin to impact the knowledge they have on the people. A candle loses nothing by lighting others. It's important they begin to impart that knowledge. Let, I mean, a priest we know, Father James and I know, used to say, knowledge is power, money is power. Oh yes, I know that. But for me, knowledge is power. When you empower the people in, a, in the part of knowledge, they will do anything you want them to do. Other two areas I want to mention, our church in Nigeria needs to pay attention, is the issue of time. We've mentioned it here, time is money, time is power. All of us who live outside Nigeria will know, you know, people are paid in hours, you know. Time is, time is money. It's important when you, when, if mass is to be one hour, make it an hour. As I said, the attention span of people is seven minutes. Let, and when our people come to mass, let them enjoy it from the environment. I tell you this now, even as a priest, if I go to any church where the environment is not suitable, I, am, I feel somehow, if our God is the God of beauty, I'll come to beauty in a minute, if our God is God of beauty, then where he stays and where we worship him has to be beautified. I'm not saying place it in gold, don't be the blank bishop, no, but at least make the environment conducive. When people come into church, let them know, oh, herein lives God. So that is time. Another thing is beauty. One of the things for which I love uh, Pope Benedict XVI is his emphasis on beauty. We all know Pope Benedict was the Pope of gold. 
and he, I mean, he believed in it, not in a negative way, but in a good way. He believes in beauty. People worship God through beauty. If our thought is beautified, if the environment is nice, if it, if it smells not lovely, and people around us are looking good, if the priest comes into mass, not wearing tattered chasuble of 20 years ago, you know, not ironed, not washed, and he calls his, um, um, he calls his a, a relic from Fratanse, you know, that maybe that priest has something, a question to answer. But, you know, let us beautify whatever we are doing and let it be attractive. Young people go by what they see. If it is attractive, they will come to it. If it is boring, they will not. Oh, thank you so much, Father John Promise. Really, um, when you talk about uh, beauty, I must surely uh, say yes to that because um, um, our young people today like, you know, their ministers, you know, when you tell them that God is good, you have to look good really to say God is good. You know, they have to see that goodness in you. They have to really see it in order to really for them to believe. But that goodness must not, or in fact, should not be in the aspect of materialism, but there should be that decency within, you know, our ministry, within the ministry. Now, I'd like to uh, go over to our YouTube channel and made mention of a few comments there. Um, someone said, I once went to church uh, without my hair scarf, so I used, now this has to do with tradition, and I would like someone else here to make a comment on this. Without my hair scarf, and I used my mom's handkerchief to cover my hair. I was refused access to church that day because the hanky isn't the same as hair scarf. I stood outside. And then someone else here says, Chidema Ajoku says, I believe that times are changing, but we shouldn't forget that the Bible does not change. We youths want to eat our cakes and have it. It's very important as well. And I need some, okay, Father Emmanuel is raising his hand. So we do not like hearing the truth. You know, that's also very, uh, very important. Someone else says, has anyone uh, read the post and other document on young people? Both the preparatory a document and Pope Francis is a cyclical on the Synod for Youth are very, very relevant to our discussion this evening. And she continues that what can be done to encourage our young people to participate in programs organized for them in their parishes or chaplaincies? What should we do to encourage them? Um, so um, here we go. Um, we need, uh, okay, Father Emmanuel, uh, uh, let, let's check on uh, Desmond. Desmond, uh, can you unmute and? Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. So, yes, Desmond is back. Yeah, he's back. So, Father, Father, um, Father Emmanuel, just a moment after Desmond. Hmm? Okay, I'll, I'll just hmm. make it very, very brief. I, I think I've said um, half of what I wanted to say. Um, the first is, I think our priests need to really buckle up and uh, realize that. It's not going to be uh, a given that somebody will stay in the Catholic Church. So they need to, like um, most of you said, prepare very well when they are, are going to hold a mass, I mean the homily. And the second is um, the youth apostolate. The chaplains in the youth apostolate need to be given a real training on how to handle the youth. Being a priest does not equate you to knowing how to handle youth you need to go to a seminar or a program on how to handle youth. If you don't do it, you're going to approach the youth with the same formation you receive in the seminary school. Stand there, go there, don't do this. And it doesn't work among the youth and it's going to be a problem. And so I think this is very important. Of course, some dioceses are doing this, especially on nature art diocese, sending youth um, priests outside to go and learn uh, youth apostolate, to come out back and teach youth with the right way of uh, youth formation. I think this is very important. Last point I'm going to make is, why uh, people leave the Catholic Church? Some people leave for reasons the church cannot do anything about it because what they are after is not what the Catholic Church stands for. We have to also realize that. There are people who want to do things that are not right. Simply they want to go, uh, um, 
uh, I don't know how to say, it, they just want to get spoiled and the Catholic Church does not permit that and they leave. And for those people, we can maybe continue to pray for them that they return back. So it's not everybody that leaves, that, that is leaving because the Catholic Church is not being able to provide for him or for her. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you guys very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, you're very much appreciated for, um, you know, I noticed you went out and you, you came back to make sure that your voice is heard. And you are uh, one person I admired so much while I was in Nigeria because I attended one of the uh, um, activities you organized for Anambra Catholic Youth at Onisha, where Mbaka was there, Father Bimonsa was there, the governors were there. I know that I had to even sneak out of the seminary to attend that very occasion. Forgive me, my rector still. So um, here we are. Um, your, your, what you were saying was the misconception of the idea of freedom that a whole lot of our young people do have today, which they do think that the church is caging them but we should also bear in mind that the church is the conscience of the society. If the church stops being the conscience of the society, then there should not be church because the church is there to actually direct us and guide us. So it's very important. So I now invite Father Emmanuel to let us into his mind. Um, just, just a quick one. I was going to pick up on that um, idea of um, a false sense of freedom that people have. Sometimes we just, um, the church does not roll over. The church is a mother. You can't just stand up to your mother and say, I want this, you have to give a proper reason. You know, talking about the things we don't know, most young persons, I happen to have a good relationship with a lot of young people. And being young myself, I know how the minds of these people work for those who are young. You know, that sense of rebellion. You know, they say you are rebelling actually, thinking you're an activist. You know, sometimes um, we're dealing with a lot of um, half, um, half big mentalities. I have to deal with an issue where, you know, in the village, you talk about burial levies, where, um, when, when, you know, a small communities, when somebody dies, each um, group, each society brings something, you know, to support them. But one young person, they just said, okay, now we have left the youth out for too long. So let's involve them. That sense of involvement, it was supposed to be an honor that you can now contribute where the elders are contributing. But he came back from that meeting to tell the people that, the other young persons that they say, they should begin to pay burial levy in case they die, in case they die themselves and somebody cannot, you know, and they will not contribute. But it was based on his own understanding. So sometimes we cannot just leave things to the youth. You know, so they, 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 it took how many years? I only came maybe after two or three years to hear the issues. And he only came up at that village square meeting I was talking about. So I had to now make them understand that these people want what they want and the church cannot give them or give you what you want every time. So sometimes, like I said earlier, uh, you, the, I encourage the youth to also, traditions are there. You know, they say when you're a Roman, you behave like a Roman. You know, talk, I, that it came to my mind when they talked about the lady who said they don't have a way. If you go to the East, the East has the heart of the Catholic Church in Nigeria. Even a, no, a non-Easterner knows that for you to go to church in the East, you have to cover your hair. Because you are coming from the UK where they don't cover their hair, does not mean that these people who are Catholics there will change their traditions for you. You should at least understand when you go back to the UK, when you go back to Lagos, continue living the way you should live. I can't come to the UK because it was winter and I got a winter coat. I come back to Nigeria and continue to wear the winter coat. I'm going to get into trouble. So sometimes the young people also have to be open-minded, you know, because they tend to give a wrong impression of the churches they run to. 
these churches have also rules. They have traditions. There are certain things you can't do. So I think, like I would say, the young people or those who, are, who have the intentions of it should do that mercifully. Don't paint the church. If you need to go, by all means, you can. You know, the, the Catholic church is not a prison, right? If you have a good, a cogent reason to leave, it's okay. Then sometimes they don't want to go through the protocols. It's not like many of our people don't know about the annulment and the divorce thing in the church, but they want to cut corners. Father, so I'm sure, so, well, be back home here, somebody wants to baptize, but they, want, they don't want to go through um, the, the instructions for the parents. So they want to just walk in into father. Let me do I And mean, if you don't do that, they say the church is too stiff. This is me trying to make a fair case for the church back home. Not everything that works out there because you experienced it once in Lagos, you come back home and expect me to do the same. And there are certain things that work. I've visited the parish before, a very old parish. This is, I don't know how I did it, but I spoke for one hour, five minutes. And the people were still, because I had a lot to say, I had experiences, I just came out of a crash. I've not had um, mass for a long time. So I couldn't even come, but I had a lot to tell these people. And when laughing throughout, the feedback I got encouraged me to keep talking to these old people. And the other priest said, how did you manage to keep talking and you didn't repeat yourself for one hour, five minutes? I said, I don't know. I felt embarrassed, but he said, you did well. But it was because there were so many issues to address. Now, so that we priests don't look down on ourselves like we're not doing enough. For me, here's the game plan. In my diocese, there's this recent reawakening. So I'm taking a little time. This recent reawakening. And the bishop has called like a synod at different levels on catechesis. You have at the parish level, at the dinner level, I dare say there are different committees. Now they have to review the books that they use for catechism. They have to review the language. They have to centralize. So that we can carry these people along. It, let's not make it sound like the church is not doing anything at all. Let's at least to some extent have mercy. Why those of us who are priests go back home, you know, to our little cubicles and begin to make the much um, expression that, or the much preparation that we can do. So for the young people, I want all of us, for me, I think of a game plan. And here's the game plan. Let everybody, priests, go back. Father, if you've recommended books. I'm personally going to look for those books, you know, so I can read them. For the young people, as you say these things, you're not going out to challenge anybody. But as you say them, I need all of you young people, all of us young, to keep talking. Not just say it and go away. Keep talking. Talk to them. If, if you guys never said it, Father James will not be conscious of it. I will not become interested in the offer that John promised or Father Valentine. We have four priests becoming interested. I've discussed this thing on other platforms. And over time, let's pick them one by one. You know, for, for one Catholic who converts and knows his or her faith very well, is what more than 10 who leave for, you know, no reason. I'm not saying people should leave. People must leave. But for those of us who are here, let's keep making effort. I, I still think of the game plan, plan while we are praying. Let us keep watching so we don't hurt people unnecessarily. Sometimes it's just mere miscom you know, mis miscommunication. People don't understand each other. But as long as we keep talking, as long as we keep dishing out materials and keep making reviews every day, I'm thinking that this, um, I'll call it a pandemic of people leaving the church. You know, it will not stop but we can have more control of it. The ones we have, we can take care. So let us reach out on all platforms, on social media, one-on-one -on -one discussions. Let your, I'm grateful for this opportunity. So I pray that we'll do more of this and God will walk through all of us who have decided to pick something on this. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for all of this. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Father Emmanuel. Um, thank you. Um, so... You, you actually said something there like um, that working together and knowing the culture and the tradition of where you have come to, because the Catholic church is a church that works within a tradition. 
the Catholic Church works within a culture and lives within the culture. Just like St. Paul, when he went to Athens, he was not really destroying everything there, but he was, he was walking through that culture and imbibing, you know, through the culture and then bringing Christ within the culture. And when you made mention of the social media, it's about also bringing Christ within, because our new culture today for the young people is the social media. It is Facebook, it's Instagram, it's TikTok, it's Twitter, it's everything about social media. And Google has become the new Ario Pegus of our time. I call Google's and your Pegus, I call YouTube the new area of Pegus, because there is every idea you need, all mashed out, just type anything on Google and you find it. But would you type something on God and always find the priests always saying something and catechizing the people about Jesus, catechizing the people about the Catholic Church? We need more, especially in Nigeria. We need... Um, for me personally, we need a church where you you have the media playing a great role. You know, while I was in St. In St. Joseph, Nigeria, um, Aba in Nigeria, I had the privilege and the opportunity to create a media room. But, um, you know, I called young people and they come in and they videotape everything that's happening within the mass. They will record your homily and immediately after the mass, they addition it out to the people. So they've recorded it. And if anyone wants it immediately after mass, it's already in a CD plate. So you can go home and keep listening to these homilies. Therefore, it makes you to always prepare your homily and make it, you know, worth listening to again, you know. And then they are moving forward, going into Facebook, going on YouTube. Now, immediately the lockdown struck last year. I was watching to see how many parishes in Nigeria will be, um, will be out there, you know, on the media. It was difficult to really find them. You find one on, on Facebook, they'll be using a mobile phone, they'll be like, tut, 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 the next thing it's caught, they'll come back again, the next thing it's caught, they'll come back again. And that is where you can catch our young people. But it was difficult for lots of parishes to really go into these media and begin immediately to evangelize, you know. And that is where the priests and the young people need to work together to find out what is there for them. They're uh, talking about, because we are in the, as Chiamaka said, we are in the critical stage. You know, most youths at their critical stage, at this very critical stage, they kind of lose their faith because they can't go into the mystical stage. So at the critical stage, they lose their Catholic faith. So we need to catch them at that critical stage. Chiamaka, would you like to say something at this moment? I think pretty much everything has been covered, but one particular point I just wanted to make was um, the bit about balance, right? I think we've all mentioned balance, but balance from the perspective of trying to unify our spiritual parts, our emotional part and our psychological part. These are things that would help you to actually give your best, right? You can't tell somebody who is struggling with, say, depression, because again, these are things that are not spoken about at home. Um, people don't believe that such mental disorders exist or anxiety or whatever. So it is, again, for those who have the expertise, and this is, again, where the collaboration that we talk about works, those who have the expertise in this field, how can they come together to create that balance, to educate people Right? How can they come together to educate people to come to Christ and to also get that healing that we're speaking, the emotional healing, psychological healing and the spiritual healing. But again, everything we're saying, all of this, it's let's do it in love. It's not a fight. We're not fighting each other. We're not fighting the church. Um, we just want things to be better. We want to draw more souls to Christ. Right. So whatever you do, do it out of love. Um, if you decide to leave the church, again, I'm speaking at the reverse. If you decide to leave the church, um, it's fine if you want to do, but do not castigate the church, right? Everybody finds their places or their faith in different places. You might not find it in Catholic church, and that's fine. And also, let us not also be concerned into other religious groups of faith. If you find your faith in some other church, that's also absolutely fine. So I think two things. First is, let's all do it in love. Second is about creating balance. How can we create balance between spiritual, psychological, and the emotional aspects of humanity. Okay, so thank you so much, Chiamaka. Thank you, um, creating the balance. Um, 
Now, I would like to invite each and every one of us to have their final statement before we, uh, before we close today. So after Chiamaka, I will go over to Sonia. Sonia, are you still there? Um, I would like to invite you to uh, make your final contribution before uh, we say the final prayer, because we have actually surpassed our two hour mark. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. And we shall come back again with a topic like this, but I will say those uh, later on. So Sonia, would you like to say a few final words? Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Father James. This was such an inspiring evening. Thank you. So to me, it's uh, like Chamaka said again, it's God first for me. You know, I use my, myself as an example. There was something I asked God for sometime in 2014. I couldn't find clarity, you know, and I, was, I prayed and I, I, I picked a particular date to find the answer. And I was praying. And this time when I was praying, I wasn't even praying in the Catholic church. And then I got my answer. So like she said, it's about salvation. It's about Christ. It's not about being a Catholic, being a Pentecostal, being whatever it is. It's about being a child of God. To me, I feel these things also. So speaking intellectually, if you ask me, I would say serving God also goes. If you, if you, if you take time to research, you figure out that you would find that serving God and being a Catholic also goes with your temperament. If truly you want to search God or find God for yourself, like I said before, being a Catholic would help you. It would be easier to find him for yourself as a Catholic. I don't know if there are people in Catholic church. I mean, there are priests who obviously will say, God told me to tell you this. But most times it's go and do a novena. Go and spend time in the Blessed Sacrament. Go and spend time with yourself. Go and spend time in hearing God for yourself. And that's one thing that I like, you know. Like um, like Father said as well, you know, we're taking this out and we're going to be evangelists. We're going to be evangelists. We're going to try and make sure that, you know, we, we, we spread the gospel more. We meet more people. And most importantly, people can, sorry, people can learn from our behavior. So I, I, there's no point being a Catholic if they cannot see it in my character, if, if they can't see it in my behavior. People should want to say, oh, wow, what church do you go to? I mean, where is your God? Let me even find your God. Let me come closer to God. So these are like the take-homes from this for me. I also like the fact that, I mean, we're discussing these things now. And just like uh, he said, I can't remember his name. Um, I can't remember his name. Uh, Desmond? No, E.K., Mr. E.K. Ezelgo. E.K. Ezelgo. Yeah. yeah, you know, he's, he did mention that if you, if you don't know God for yourself, it will be a boring regime. Yes, I've experienced that before. I, I remember when I used to go to morning mass, and I'm like, what's going on here? But eventually, when you eventually click in, when it makes sense to you, when you fi can find God for yourself, you know that that five, 10 minutes, that 30 minutes that you spend in the Catholic church is everything, you know? And maybe we should just find ways, which I really encourage, and I like what Father James is doing, as well as every other priest who have been able to come encounter with or, or across with. I like the fact that we're turning these things into, you know, into ways that can fit or fit young people, you know, for the kind of person that I am, I sent something to Father James a few days ago when I posted this on my page and some guy whose dad used to be the vice president was like, Sonia, these are just evil people here. Like, you, have to, you have to be federal in everything that you do. I was going to curse him out. I remember I was just going to insult his life, but then I figured there's really no point since this thing is, this is about God. So if there are ways that we can get in more people, you know, there are ways we can make people understand that it's not just about being Igbo, it's not just about being Catholic. The whole idea is that you are able to serve God. You know, maybe have come back home online, pray our rosaries online, pray a pray blessed sacrament, whatever. I don't know, just like every other church is doing. You know, if we can do more of that, which I don't know if it's possible, because I know we have to go through an order. You can't just start praying online or something. If I think you need a clearance from the bishop or something. Like, I don't know, I'm not sure. But if we can do more of that, I feel like, you know, so that being said, yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, yeah. yeah, online, online, online ministration. I, it took me a whole while to really figure it out, to, to allow myself to be open online. Like um, recently, I even um, 
I think it was through you, Sonia, that I got introduced to, to, to Clubhouse because I've, I've not heard it really until I saw you posting Clubhouse because of your own organization. And then I decided to go in there, jump in there. And I've been listening to topics on Clubhouse. And I assure you one of these days, I'm going to come into Clubhouse with Faith Chat platform. And we are going to start making Faith Chat, you know, reading on Clubhouse as well. Because today I'm getting some followers as well on Clubhouse. And gradually we are coming in there because we need to really spread our tentacles to be everywhere to teach the people the faith in ways that we can, in ways they will understand. Um, I'll go over to Ike Ezogo to let us into his mind. And But just before you go on, someone said here, which is very interesting, and which is kudos to all of us, I'm not a Catholic, but I have really enjoyed this session. Every speaker nailed it. Ike Ezogo, please. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Juliet Ani. Thank you, Father John Promise. Thank you, Father Emmanuel. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Chair Maka. Thank you, Father James. And thank you, Father Valentine, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, we all agreed on one thing. The church needs a culture shift to engage uh, young people. It needs to work the work. It needs to talk the talk. It needs to articulate clearly its purpose to make disciples, just like uh, Father John Promise uh, affirmed, to make disciples, to bring people to personal relationship with Christ. That really matters. This builds the defenses that we need to, to shield ourselves, to keep ourselves together as one. Because when we are not, uh, when we are not solid on the word, you know, we'll be swayed so easily. So the church needs a cause to shift. And uh, there's something that Father, uh, I'm not trying to, I, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, he's a padre, he's a, he's a priest. There's a point he made, Father Emmanuel, about um, uh, if you go to Rome, you do like Romans. But there are something I believe that some things that are ideal. There are some things that make no sense in this current uh, uh, time. Um, I'm not saying that we're in a, we're in a, um, head scarf and all that in areas like on the Chinese Empire of Nigeria is not uh, a good thing. But then should that be the reason why you should turn someone away from from participating in the church? Is it good enough? What if that person is not aware of that? What if that person is a visitor? You know, we should try not to be this rigid. Try not to be so rigid for things that don't really, things that are not of the soul. These are, I mean, material stuff. So many places in the Bible, Christ went beyond all these things and still minister and still heal and still do some certain things. So let us not, uh, um, uh, just like, the, the, there are there are few 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 major um what do you, what what they call it cardinal uh, uh, cardinal duties of that I can't remember the way it, it's uh, accepted you know to bury the dead to do this I've seen pe a, a priest actually refuse to bury the dead for some silly reasons you know dues and stuff like that these things you change as a matter of fact. You know, these things should change. Did you did you ever ask these people where why they were living if they fed well? Did you visit them? So we said the poor, did they actually reach out to them? You know, these are the things that we need to talk about. You know, these are the things that we need to actually delve into. You know, these are human beings, these are our brothers and sisters. And we're human beings, even before being a priest. Let's talk about you people should, with all due respect, Padros, go and talk about this. All this being too rigid for, uh, for, 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 I don't even know how, all these petty, petty, petty reasons. You, you denied someone the final grace before meeting its father. You wouldn't even actually bury him because he did not pay his dues. I mean, we should think about this. We should do something about it. These are the things that are still keeping us where we are. These are not the core, core, you know, uh, I mean, they're not core to our faith, to, to what really matters. 
that's my take on that for the moment. I'm not trying to dispute you. You're my superior in that field. Yeah, I mean, you been to philosophy, theology, or whatever. I'm only saying the little. I would say, but you know, I feel that something needs to be done. Things like that actually put me off. You know, denying folks some privileges. You know, that they deserve naturally. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure being part of this discussion. Shalom. God, God, <laughs> God bless you, Ike. Okay. Um, your, 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 I must tell you that your frustration uh, is also a frustration for many. Like you mentioned about funeral and the rest of them, it's also a frustration for many. And uh, we have a culture, we have a tradition. And uh, but people, uh, the bishops of the Catholic diocese in Nigeria, they are making efforts to see that these things are workable. You know, remember. Remember your, your, for instance, here, here, I must tell you this, there is a, there is a difference here. <laughs> Someone came and said, oh, my mom has died. Ah, oh, so sorry, so sorry. And she, she, her last wish was to have you bury her. I haven't seen her in the church. I haven't really, she hasn't been, you know, featuring, but she made that last wish. Oh, okay, no problem, no problem. And she wants you to say mass for her on that day. Now look at what will happen. On the day of the funeral, you come in to celebrate the mass, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, nobody responds, amen. The Lord be with you, everyone, because they haven't maybe been to church. They have not been to church. They don't know what it is all about. And you have to be telling them time to sit. Please sit. Please kneel. Please stand. And during the time to kneel, they will all sit down because they don't really know what's going on. And that is what we are trying to avoid in the Nigerian church. We want to continue to keep people within it. So, but what we need to do is to find a balance like Chiamaka made mention of find a balance to accommodate all these things and also to accept certain compromises. But let us not open a window that will also create a huge loophole and then lead to, uh, to watering down of the, you know, of the church's um, uh, strong tenets. Now, I would like to invite Juliet. Juliet, you've been quiet for a very long time. I would like to invite you now to give us your final words. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much. It's been a, a fascinating topic. And um, thank you to everyone that has contributed, both on the Zoom call and on YouTube and other platforms that you're using to spread this out, Father James. Um, I just wanted to say that no system is perfect. There is only always room for improvement. I had someone tell me that even though she has left Catholic Church, she still has questions where she is that are yet unanswered. So there is no system that is perfect at all. So if we have that in mind, I know it's just about getting better and um, it's, not, it's not fight as, <laughs> as was said earlier. I also wanted to say that it would be good for our priests to integrate more. I know that we'll have population. Population is a good thing, but sometimes it can work against us. As someone said earlier, you know, when you know that people will always turn up to church, which is not always the case outside of Nigeria in all places. So if you know that you only have maybe 20 people today, and if you're not careful, it could be down to 15 tomorrow, you definitely, you know, be out, you know, shaky there, be sure they are all well and good. But in Nigeria, most churches, most Catholic churches in Nigeria, you've got the population. So even if 10 people don't show up to church on the next Sunday, no one will even notice. So if the priest can integrate more, have more practical and workable feedback loop system. And by that, I mean, so if you even want to hear back from the youth, if you want to hear back from your parishioners, what have you put in place to be able to achieve that? It's not so much as having one rusty suggestion box hanging somewhere, you know, do you go to visit groups when they are meeting, do you go to the Legion of Mary and say, okay, Father is coming to visit us today to talk to us? You know, how, how do you integrate? How are, are you accessible to your parishioners? Yes, there are so many of them, but do you always only see a particular few? You know, there is a professor somewhere that has direct access to you. Whenever he wants to speak to you, he can speak to you. How about one young girl, one young boy somewhere that is a nobody? Do they have access to you? 
are you only interacting with the head of C CWO, head of CMO, head of this, head of that? How can the lay ordinary Catholic faithful have access to, to spiritual guidance, to, to, to the priest, to, to the bishop? You know, it's, it's really different here, maybe because there are not so many Catholics at the moment in the UK compared to in Nigeria. You know, if, if you need something, and you need to speak to a priest, I'm, I'm sure it's definitely easier here. So some people in Nigeria will not even bother anymore, you know, because there are so many people that need to see the priest. But I think that the priest can also do more. So if you know that there are people that have more access to you, you know, have a point of duty to say, okay, this week I would like to speak to maybe five people that I've never spoken to before and, and just keep that going. It's a huge task for starting from somewhere would definitely help a lot. And then I wanted to say as well, eventually if someone then decides to leave the Catholic church, it's, it's not, the person is not getting condemned. So, you know, someone was saying to me, so why would the family of someone that decides to leave the Catholic church persecute the person? I wanted to think, oh my goodness, that is a very strong word, but it, it's probably even happening, you know, they, you might say, oh, we're not attending your wedding because you're going to marry someone that is not a Catholic. It's not, I don't think it's necessary, you know, to get it to that point. So at the end of the day, the ultimate goal is salvation. I mean, we are all Christians. It shouldn't matter to that extent that one should be persecuted for, for leaving the Catholic Church. Thank you so much. Wow, that's a very important point there. And uh, um persecution for leaving the Catholic Church should not actually be the case. Uh, parents should be able to address the faith of their children. Parents should be able to call their children to order. And that was what we said initially. Um, you cannot give what you don't have. If parents, you know, um, prepare themselves very well, are well founded within the faith, you find out that they can transmit that faith to their children, that their children will be longing to hear more and to get more. Uh, but most parents end up being the money mass going people and hearing, and then they will, they will not understand the more. And that is why our conversation today, our discussion today will help for people to, and for also the church, for priests to be really up and doing, you know, in catechizing the people. and. Uh, someone said it's all about cramming the catechism because someone wrote, you know, it's cramming the catechism. That was a time when it's only about cramming the catechism without really knowing it very well, knowing what it's all about, understanding it, but cramming the words, which was what we did. And I've forgotten most of them by now, <laughs> you know, but we need to do more uh, than that. I would like to right now have, uh, invite um, Father um father val do you have any last words before i invite father john promise i mean it's um just i mean we've said everything you know but but um as we were talking and then we mentioned the catechism and everything and and like juliet said you know it's all about salvation right that ultimate goal you know that's where we all are heading to and and i'm thinking about it and i just thought about the um, I think it's question six on the Baltimore Catechism, um, where it asks, why, why did God make you? You know, God made me to know him, to love him, um, and to serve him here on earth in this world so that I will be happy with him um, in the world after. So here it, it's individual, it's personal. Um, you know, and I think that in as much as it is the same for us priests um, to do everything we can to keep these young people in church, it is also their responsibility to understand that their faith belongs to them. Um, you know, they have to do everything that they can to live this faith as a personal individual experience. And so I, I, I love to say to young people, it's time we move from the pray for me mentality to the I am praying for myself mentality. So where we begin to understand that this is the church, the faith that the Lord has given me, if I don't leave it for myself in order to be able to be with him on the last day that is salvation focused, 
um, then I am failing. The priest will do everything that they can. We can all do all we can, um, the social media and all, but, but if it is not a personal experience, if we are not convinced, especially the young ones, that this is something that I have to take up for myself because this is where my eternal soul lies, you know, that I'm doing this not because of my parents or even because of the priest, but I'm doing this because I know that at the end of the day, you know, heaven will be my reward and I will be happy um, to be with the Lord in his kingdom. But it's just to say that, of course, um, we on our part, on our side, priests, we have to always remember that, you know, in as much as we want to hold on to law and tradition and custom, we also have to know that, you know, there is the aspect of love there, um, you know, that we are like parents, right? We, we beat the kids probably with the right hand and then we draw them back again with the left hand, but we have to do all this in love um, and to understand that the ultimate goal here is for salvation. And thus, anything that will um, prevent, you know, those ones who are seeking God um, from getting to him or from having access to him, um, we should try as much as we can to take those things out. Oh, thank you, thank you so very much, um, Father Val. Um, I will, I will, I will get back to you sometime soon because our next discussion, not immediate, will be on Mary because. Uh, one of the reasons why one of the persons that left the Catholic Church when she entered the university was the fact that um, she did not understand why Catholics have statues in the churches and why um, there is that honor we pay to our Blessed Mother Mary as the mother of God, the mother of Jesus Christ who himself is God. And it has actually led a lot of people away from the church. So um, I've uh, tagged it to be a different topic altogether where we discuss everything about Mary. Now, I will, uh, there is no other person raising their hand. So um, Father Emmanuel, uh, I think, have you said your last words before I invite Father John Promise who after saying his last words, uh, not before he dies though. <laughs> you know, say your last final words before he dies, no. But, uh, um, and then say the closing prayer for us. Uh... Well, my final thoughts are thoughts of gratitude, thoughts of um, I'm feeling challenged already. I'm feeling like um, there's a lot more we can do. And I feel encouraged that um, it's a battle, but it's not a lost one. You know, it's, um, it's easier to go into a battle when you have help. And it was easier for Joshua and Gideon and all of those people to go into battle and for David and all of that to go, and all of that went as because they had the ark. So I can say everyone who's here is um, in some sort of ark, you know, for us to do the much we can, you know, like um, Father Val just called us out here in the open, you know, we're talking to ourselves in the open. So it's not like we're going to have any kind of any kind of inner caucus meeting, but we're all out here working together. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Chamaka. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone who's here. I'm, I'm grateful and I hope that we'll do more and we'll do better. I pray for God's grace and mercy. So it's my prayer that God will bring us, like I'd always say, grace and light. God bless you. Thank you. You are a priest of grace and light, and you actually inspired me with your story. Grace and light story. Guys, you need to know Father Emmanuel's story. It's a huge one. So thank you so much, Father Emmanuel, uh, for that. Thank you. So um, Father JP, here we are. Bring it on. My last few was before I say uh, the closing prayer. Just three brief things. Um, one is, in this book I mentioned, uh, Christus Vivid, uh, number 178, the Pope addressed the youth saying, the youths are the now of the church. So there is, if there are any young people listening to us this night, you are the now of the church. You are the now of the world. Do not let anybody or anyone tell you otherwise. 
because God needs you. We need you. The church needs you. Without you, there is no future for the church. Don't mind Buhari, who has been here even, be, even before I was born. Don't mind Buhari, he will soon go. I can tell you that. Don't mind Audubon, who has been there before my dad was born. <laughs> you are the now of the church. Having said that, second thing I want to you know, re also remind all of us, there is what I call the Christ methodology. The Christ methodology, which we read in the gospel of last Sunday, um, Mark chapter one, from verse 29 to 31, we are told that Jesus Christ was told about Peter's mother-in-law. And we are told Christ did three things. Christ went to her, took her by the hand, and cured her. That is a Christ methodology. The church needs to meet the people where they are. Christ didn't say, Simon Peter, bring your mother-in-law to the synagogue, no. Even though the synagogue was beside, as we know today in Capernaum, the synagogue was beside Peter's mother-in-law house, Peter's um, house. Christ went to her. The church is meant to go to the young people where they are. Be they learned, be they illiterate, be they professionals, be they not. Be they people who work at the main market of our nature, or Ari Ari Aba, or Obe the market, wherever they are. The church needs to go to them. The church needs to take them by the hand and then hold them up. Finally, in 2010, when I was in my last year in the seminary in Nigeria, Father George Husane, who was at that time the secretary of the Bishops' Conference in Nigeria, was given the permission by the bishops in Nigeria to go to all the seminaries and give a seminar. He came to my seminary in Onicha, Tansi Seminary, and the seminar was this very simple thing. He told us as seminarians then that the church in Nigeria needs to change or what happened to the church in Ireland will happen to us. That was the simple message. What did he tell us? What happened to the church in Ireland? We all know the island of the 1950s and 60s, we had the priests, we had clerical, clericalism, the priests were dishing it out, law and order, they were masters of everything. And the people we are in fright, afraid of their lives. Rewind just years back in the 1990s and early, two, early, early 2000, that church has now died down to the point that one of us, our beloved Archbishop Jude Okoro is now their papal nuncio. Who would have thought that a simple Nigerian priest would one day be a papal nuncio in Ireland? But that's what it has come to. But the advice is not just for Ireland, it's also for Nigeria. If we do not change now, we will lose the youths in their numbers and we might be having our churches closed and sold as we are experiencing in Europe and America. But thank you all who have spoken tonight. You've been so wonderful. I've also been enriched by your presence and your thoughts. And I can't wait to go back and put most of those things in practice, even here uh, in my little um, abode. So thank you, Father James, for everything you do. Thank you. So uh, my final words, thank you so much, everyone, for participating in this. Thank you, Father John Promise. Thank you, Father Valentine. Thank you, Father Emmanuel. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Ike Ezog. Thank you, Desmond, for being the mouthpiece, for being a minister, a messenger. You know, immediately you saw this topic. <laughs> you know, it was like fire. The way you attacked me, yeah. <laughs> no, Miss It was like fire. You know, you came in and you wanted really, you know, and that was great. Thank you so much. Thank Desmond. you, Father. That shows this deal in your heart. Thank you, everyone that has joined us. We had D, Sam, Sunshine, Angoli, Yvonne, and those who joined us later on. So thank you so much, everyone, for being part of this. Listen, let us go home now, continue to say our prayers, continue to hope, because there is only one thing we can do. Hold on to hope. Hold on to our prayers. Continue to act out that which we believe in. I assure you, one day things will be better. The, the world will see the light because there is nothing more we are seeking for but the world to see the light and heaven, that we shall make heaven at last, that is that salvation. So, and um, thank you everyone, thank you. Uh, we shall 
uh, how far that John promised. And thank you, yes, to everyone who joined us via the live stream on YouTube. Um, we have everyone here. We had like more than 50 persons that joined us, yeah, via uh, the live stream on YouTube. So thank you all. We saw your comments. We saw your, um, uh, your suggestions, your questions and all. Thank you. They are all very, very important. And I believe as time go on, people will watch it and they will also find certain reconciliation. I would like to say a word to someone making a decision now to leave the church. Like Chiamaka said, let everything you are doing be out of love. Think it twice. Okay, ask questions. Whatever you do not understand, do not be afraid to meet your priest. Ask questions. If they cannot be open to you or are not available to you, because I know most priests some, sometimes they are not available. They want to take their siesta or watch Chelsea or Manchester United or anything, you know, they're not available. But listen, you have the priest on the social media. You have my, you have my, uh, my handle because I'm always there to hear people, to chat with people on Instagram, on Facebook, wherever, you know, hit us up and we shall be there. Father John Promise is also on Instagram. Father Emmanuel, Father Valentine, uh, please let her on, uh, chat me up, let's uh, have a good chat. So, um, so hit us up and we'll be there to listen to you, to answer your questions and to help you out. So thank you so much, everyone. And I pray our discussion today bear great fruit. Father John Promise, I'll invite you now from the island of Jersey. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> we we, for us. Okay. we, we um, close by saying, in the name of the Father and Amen. of the Son Amen. and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray with Psalm 25, 125 this morning. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Lord, we've listened to your word. We've communed as brothers and sisters and friends. We want to move things forward in your church. St. John the 23rd prayed for a new Pentecost. We pray also today for a new Pentecost in the church in Nigeria upon our young people and upon all those who lead them. May our, the church in Nigeria flourish. May our people draw closer to you and may our families and friends be blessed. All this we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And my almighty God bless all of you gathered here, the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your